In the heart of my city, there sits an abandoned hospital. It stood in practice for nearly 60 years before closing its doors for the very last time in 2010. No trespassing signs and private property signs littered everywhere and are on every external wall of the building, encouraging people, of course, to stay out. The city hoped that it would remain untouched. However, that didn't last, as it eventually became a hotspot for teens and young adults to explore and party. It wasn't too long after that, that rumors of the hospital being haunted circulated around the city. Once city officials caught wind of the stories and break-ins, they decided to hire a security company with two 12-hour surveillance shifts so that the hospital could be monitored 24 hours a day. Despite the enforcement, people would still break in, and depending on the situation at hand, the police will get called. Neil. The call came in around 3 a.m. 911, what's your emergency? Hi, it's Neil from RS Security. Uh, I think I need an officer to swing by or something. Okay, can you tell me why you need assistance? The number and address on my screen were well known to me. It wasn't out of the ordinary for security to call for backup. I'm... I'm at the old hospital and... I, I don't know how to explain it. He sounded nervous, like it was his first time calling. Start from the beginning. We'll take it from there, okay? Oh, okay, uh, well, I was checking the cameras like I'm supposed to do and I was flipping through them and I saw some guy standing in the nursery ward. The... The, the guy who trained me told me about some crazy dude who likes to hide in there. No one really knows how he gets in. Um, I, I'm only a week and a half on the job and it's my first day alone and he told me, he told me that if I, if I see the guy, just scare him out the building, but... Uh, are you still there, Neil? I asked, breaking the sudden silence. Yeah, sorry. I thought I lost one of the feeds, but it's all good. That's okay. So, you were saying that you tried to scare the guy out the building? Then what happened? Oh, um, I went out to try and find him and kicking him out. But when I got up there, my flashlight ran out of juice and the lights aren't allowed on because people think the hospital's still open. Um, anyway, I walk into the nursery ward and I was yelling for him to come out and that if he didn't, I'd get the police involved. And that's when he started laughing. I could barely see anything, so I just followed the sound and out of nowhere, someone grabbed me by the arm and pushed me to the floor. It all happened so fast, but like, I, I could still hear the crazy guy laughing down the hall, so I bolted out of there and there's no way it was him. Did you recheck the cameras when you got back? Yeah, I looked at them again and the guy was still there, but there's no one else on that floor. I checked and rechecked. And I know you're probably thinking, I'm crazy or something, but I have scratches on my arm from the other person on that floor. There's no way it was the other guy unless he can be in two places at once. There's no way. I could hear the panic in the guy's voice as he spoke through what he encountered. Okay, so the scratches came from someone else grabbing your arm and not the man who was laughing, correct? I asked, making sure I was following what he said. Yes, I could hear his frustration with me. The crazy guy's still there. I'm watching him right now, but the other person in the building is somewhere. Wherever they are, I can't find them with the cameras, and I'm sure as hell not going back up there. The police need to handle it now. Okay. I've dispatched the police, and they should arrive shortly. Are you okay? Do you need paramedics for your arm? No, I don't think so. It stings, but I think I'll be... He cut himself off mid-sentence. Neil? Is everything all right? The, the man, he's just... He's just gone. I've been watching him this whole time and I, I, I looked away for a second in my arm and... He's gone. Wait. Where is he? Oh my God. Oh my God. What is it? What's going on, Neil? He's in the stairwell. He's running. What if he's coming for me? What do I do? I, I don't have a weapon. What do I do? What do I do? You're in the office, correct? Is the door locked? Get inside. I heard him put down the phone and quickly shuffled to the door, and then he screamed. There was a bang on the door, another scream, and then a thud. 
and then I could hear footsteps and static infiltrate the line. Neil? I spoke hesitantly into the static, and waited a few seconds until the call was cut off. Elise arrived on the scene about a minute after the call ended. Neil was found in the security office, unconscious with a minor injury to his head. When they had asked Neil about what happened, he apparently had no recollection. He said the last thing he remembered was getting to work. The officer swept the entire building looking for two possible suspects, both of which could not be found. They also said they checked every possible entrance that they knew of, but there were no signs of anyone entering the building. To this day, I receive calls from security about the same man in the nursery ward. However, after Neil's incident, they no longer leave their security office and immediately call the police. People still don't know how he gets in, but assume that he's living somewhere within the abandoned hospital. Seems like a good idea to tear down that building. I used to be afraid of cats. There was no incident, no deep-rooted trauma, no anything I could or can name. My mum hated them, never let me around them, and I suppose from there, ignorance spread fear. When a stray feline wandered onto our driveway, I would let out a little squeal of fear and dart into the house, and that would be as close as I got. I used to be afraid of cats, until Holly. Holly and I spent our younger years together, from elementary to middle school, third grade to eighth. I slept over at her place every week, and we'd wander downtown from the local market to the nearby park, to the city mall, each year going a little farther, and growing in our confidence. When we were 11 and 12, I slept over at her house as usual, watching horror movies until the wee hours of the morning, and telling jokes we were too young to know. The afternoon came, and I learned Holly's older brother Isaiah had a piano lesson at their church. Already a godless little heathen, I wanted to stay at their house and play Smash on Isaiah's Wii, but Holly convinced me to tag along, saying we could play in their yard, and she could finally introduce me to a cat. I eventually agreed, and into the minivan we piled. Her mum dropped us off and went to run errands. Isaiah strode towards the main building, and Holly and I went trampling through the long grass. A row of houses laid on dilapidated property, on the other side of broken down fences. These houses and these buildings lay beside an empty road. Holly squatted down next to a hole in the fence, and started clinging her tongue on the roof of her mouth. I stared at her blankly for a few moments before looking towards the road. No cars, no people, Nothing. When I finally look back, I see her holding a dark grey cat. Even my inexperienced eyes could tell she was older, and based on the unimpressive look on her mushy little face, she was probably accustomed to being picked up by children. Holly explained that this was Bubbles, who constantly wandered over to the field outside the church in search of food, or butterflies or whatever else cats look for. He'd been doing it for years, so being picked up by children was nothing new for him. In short, he was the perfect cat for a girl afraid of cats to try and meet. I let Holly carry him as we wandered around the field, occasionally leaning over to give him a tentative pet. When boredom, as it inevitably does, infected us, we set our sights on the building closest to us. It was technically a church property, and Holly explained that, but they rarely used it. Some classes were held in the upper levels, but usually the bottom floor and entire building were deserted. What were we to do? Two girls and a cat walked into a bar, and I forget how the rest of this joke goes, so we wandered into the building, bubbles meowing softly, but not sounding bothered. Most of the halls were speckled with dust, sunlight filtering in through dirty and shuttered windows. There were no lights on, and while we see switches all over the place, we're unwilling to turn them on. Maybe we just like the creepy atmosphere, but trapezing around like this is thrilling. When I ask her if we'll get in trouble for being here, she rolls her eyes and tells me to relax. But since her brother is here taking a lesson in the other building, we're allowed to be here. But maybe we should avoid getting caught. 
You know, just in case. The building had multiple exits, each leading to a different little area. One is closer to the main church building where Isaiah is, another borders a small patch of woods, or at least a gathering of trees and flowers and squirrels. Yet another leads to a dirt road that spirals away to somewhere Holly and I don't know. As we pick our way through the hallways, we find a small banquet room, three dozen tables with long tablecloths pooling on the floor, two doors leading to a kitchen. As Holly and I walk towards the doors, our voices, a low whisper and laced with giggles, we hear it, a slam. We look at each other, bubbles grumbling at the sudden sound, inconsistent footsteps echoing down the hallway stomping and stumbling and sliding along the linoleum floors, slumping into the walls and slurring speech. It's a man, and because I don't speak the language, it's all I can gather. Is this what a drunk person's like? It had to be. I don't know what he's saying, but I can recognize the language, and I look to Holly. I can tell she understands because her face is pale. We hold our breath, praying to the god of this building, but the man is getting closer. Holly grips my arm and drags me towards one of the tables. Immediately understanding what she wants, I crawl under the table, waiting for her to join me before pulling the tablecloth back down. We stayed silent, shaking, listening to the drunken man enter the room. I still can't tell what he's saying, but he certainly sounds agitated. He didn't sound that close to us. But who would want him to get closer? We cover our mouths, try to stop breathing altogether, and sat there for what felt like hours, but was probably only more than a few minutes. Bubbles purred and meowed lightly every once in a while, but he was quiet and quickly stopped when we showed him some affection. The footsteps finally disappeared down the hallway we'd come from. I turned to Holly, opening my mouth to talk when she stops me. Aussie. Let's get out of here. I nod in agreement and squirm out from under the table, the two of us silently making our way down the hall that the man had just stumbled from. We emerged on the dirt road and without a second thought, circled around the building back towards the door we'd entered from. Maybe the man was still stumbling through the building or perhaps he'd already left. But when we entered the field, we were once again alone. Holly never told me what the man was saying and like stupid children, we didn't tell anyone what happened. We didn't want to get in trouble for trespassing after all. I never found out what he said since Holly didn't want to talk about it. And understandably, I haven't been back to that place since. When I was younger, every year for Christmas, I would drive upstate to my aunt's house along a stretch of highway. I cannot for the life of me remember the name of this road all I know is it runs nearby Akron at some point. However, most of the drive is through rural areas with little to no towns nearby. It was the dead of night, and my groggy self had gotten off a long shift and had to drag my ass to my aunt's house, since my extended family was expecting me there the following morning. Halfway through the drive, I realized I was low on gas, which irritated me. My brother told me he had filled it up the day before, so he either forgot or was straight lying. I saw an archaic looking sign for a gas station off the next road. It wasn't an official road sign, literally a pole with a slab of metal attached with gas off next exit or something along those lines painted on it. That seemed a little sketchy, but people do the same thing with fruit stands on highways, so whatever. I pulled off at the next exit on some dilapidated country road through dense woods. The whole thing was creepy and surreal. I kept expecting Leatherface to come running out the trees with a chainsaw. Eventually I came to the gas station and quickly realized it hadn't been open for years. It was all rusted and the convenience store roof was caving in. The gas pumps had all been taken out as well. I pulled over next to it and checked my gauge. I probably would only make it another half mile before running out. So I called AAA and they said they'd send a truck over. Now I was playing the waiting game. I left my engine on because when the headlights were off, everything was pitch black and my paranoid self 
wasn't sitting next to an abandoned gas station in the middle of a forest in complete darkness. So most of the wait went uneventful, until I sensed movement around the side of the old store where my lights are pointed at. I look up but didn't see anything, so I look back down at my phone. Then over the sound of the night I hear someone yell, Hey buddy, come over here! In a demanding tone. I look up, and there's a dude standing by the old store looking towards me, illuminated by my headlights. He looked like a run-of-the-mill homeless guy. I was honestly spooked and figured he must have been squatting there. Still watching him, I rolled up my windows and yelled something like, Yeah, what's up? Still mentally crapping myself. I had my foot ready to floor it out of there at the first sign of trouble. You got any change? No, man, I don't. I look up at him. He has this kind of vacant expression and is standing stiff. Then I see more movement. There are heads. About 20 or so heads peeking around trees beyond the man I'm talking to. I can't see them clearly, but they're definitely people, literally just heads staring in my direction from around the trees. I see another guy begin to walk from around the gas station, and then I turned around to speed off. I got about as far away from that place as my tank could carry me and updated AAA on my location. The driver came back over and filled me up. I didn't say anything. But after he left, I wanted to call the cops, so I called the nearest town sheriff's department, and they said that they'd send a state trooper over at the location I gave. When I got to my aunt's house, they called me back and said whoever was there was gone, but they could tell a large number of people had been living there for a while. Blankets, canned food, the usual. The whole situation still freaks me out, but frankly, I just consider myself lucky. I'll always just have a creepy story to tell and nothing bad happened. As a very young child in the 1980s, I used to be taken by the Easter Bunny to the North Pole to play with Santa every year on Christmas Eve. I was sworn to secrecy about this or else the Easter Bunny said he wouldn't come back. And these visits happened every year without fail. At the North Pole, we would play together in a two dimensional space and the games we would play were educational in nature, but very fun. The experience was more like a projection or video game, but I would experience it as real. It's hard to describe. I have no recollection of the specifics outside of brief memory from my last visit. What I do know is that I loved these trips so much that before my last trip at the age of six or seven, I was actually more excited for the Easter Bunny to come and take me than I was for Christmas the next day. On this trip, I was told I was getting too old for these visits and this would be the last one. And I was profoundly sad. For a few years after the Easter Bunny visits, all was quiet. Then when I was nine, the first and only abduction I can clearly recall occurred. I don't recall the initiating events. By the time I came to, I was already being led into my front yard. It was lit up like day. I say being led, but I can't remember if I was alone or if I had some sort of escort. I want to say there were entities either side of me. My childhood front yard was basically a jungle, but there was one patch of grass that opened into the sky. On more than one occasion, I had sleepwalked here as a child and awoken on this patch of grass in the middle of the night. In the center of the patch of grass was a tiny silver craft what I could describe as a typical flying saucer, only extremely small. The craft was so squat that I probably couldn't even fully stand up inside it as a nine-year-old child. I would estimate it was over five feet tall and 12 and a half feet across, and it hovered about four feet off the ground. I don't recall if there was ever any sort of landing gear on it or if it was freely floating. In front of the craft, walking towards it and perpendicular to myself, was a classic grey alien. It did not acknowledge me. The creature was childlike in stature, probably a foot shorter than me at nine. I only having seen my first drawing of a grey alien a few months before this on a television program, I should have been terrified after viewing that. Despite that, being confronted by one in real life for the first time, I felt a sense of calmness and serenity. 
There was some sort of opening in the craft, but I can't recall if it was a hatch or gangway. I was escorted towards the opening, and I remember as I passed the outside of the hull, there being Egyptian-looking hieroglyphics inscribed along the lip of the craft, and then I blacked out. I'm seated on a bench in front of a glass screen. Across from me is a grey. Our attention is devoted to one another, and we are interfacing through the glass screen device. I am in what I take to be the interior of the craft, but the room is far physically larger than would be possible based on the exterior of the saucer. There are other beings in the room who are engaging in other tasks besides what me and my partner are doing. My attention is wholly devoted on the screen and the task at hand. The screen is a clear glass screen set on a table approximately four feet in height and there is some manner of console on my side that I am using to interface with. I do not recall the Grey having anything to use the interface with the device. The task I am devoted to had something to do with communicating between English and the alien language. A thought suddenly comes to me. Why am I using this device to translate between English and the alien language when we can just talk using our minds? I find this thought very funny, as I am having fun though the precise nature of what was going on eludes me. What I believe is I am typing in English, and having it translated to the alien on the other side. This doesn't make much sense though, because I understand these beings to be able to communicate telepathically. As I use the device, the grey is also using it at times, whether to teach, correct, or communicate, I cannot recall. And I black out again. The final stage of my abduction is a series of movies projected directly into my mind. I only recall two of them. In the first, I am in an inlet, in a sea of sorts, of the land before time. The earth is primordial and pristine, and I am moving through the water towards the mouth of the bay, and along the coast on either side is luscious, unspoiled jungle, and it is profoundly beautiful. The second is a snippet of an apocalyptic environmental image. I see breakwater on a coastline with a lighthouse situated on it, waves are surging over the sides and consuming the coast. I am made to understand that humanity is responsible for what is happening here, and then it all ends. When I awoke the next day I didn't feel scared or terrified, but a sense of calm and inner peace. My mind however felt totally overloaded with way too much that I had been given to remember. I was startled by the fact that I hadn't been afraid of the greys, because I had been having constant nightmares about them as soon as I first learned of them a few months prior. I was far more concerned, fixated even, upon remembering the message I had been given. The message, which seemed all-consumingly important, began to slip through my fingers as soon as I woke up. It was only through sheer will that I was able to retain the two snippets that I have recalled today. For many years I chalked up these memories to a sleep disorder, or being the fantasies of a child, and left them in my past. Then a few years ago I stumbled across an acclaimed abductee called Jim Sparks, and the parallels to my own experience were instantly uncanny. Instead of talking about medical experimentation or sperm extraction or other common abductee claims, he talked about how the aliens would place him in front of a glass screen to learn how to translate the alien alphabet. What's more, he talked about a mass abduction event that would have occurred when I was nine, in which the abductees were all gathered and shown images of Earth's oceans unspoiled prior to human damage, and then the deteriorous effect of human industry and pollution upon the world. He talks about the specific environmental imagery in abductees, he talks about the mass abduction event, and much more in many of his talks. I would not vouch for the veracity of anything he discusses, because he does make some very outlandish claims. I am very hesitant of anyone claiming to know the nature or purpose of whatever this insane phenomenon is, but I cannot deny it though, at least for my own abduction experience. He was right on the money. What he described is precisely what I remember experiencing. As someone who has repressed these experiences, I just couldn't do it anymore after seeing his talk. It really did happen to me. The thought was liberating and terrifying. I now make my living as an environmental scientist. <laughs> I know, right? 
Those memories do not dictate my life. For many years, I used my scientific background and demands of proof to always dismiss my childhood experiences. But I was being dishonest with myself. I will now say whatever this phenomenon is, I am an experiencer of it. I'm a relatively new dispatcher. I've been working for about a year and a half in a small town. I work for 10 hour shifts and three of those I am alone for the entire shift, working police and fire. In the last year and a half, I've never lost anyone. For some reason, my welfare check calls had all been false alarms and my medical call EMRs were always able to get them stable enough to wait for an ambulance. Those calls were few and far between for a start, but all turned out okay, and I was still very green in that respect. About two weeks ago, I had someone call from out of state in near hysterics because a woman in our town was sending cryptic statements to her via text about ending her life, but no one knew exactly where she was. M had made statements about not being far from home and something about a cemetery and that she was going to use a rope. The family member said M had made an attempt about a month prior, but law enforcement arrived and saved her life. I called the last person M had seen and then called every person M was known to associate with for a vehicle description, clothing description, mood, anything that could help me. I also started a ping on her cell phone and had officers checking all local cemeteries and requesting help from the sheriff's office when the ping was located just outside our jurisdiction. Eventually, the sheriff's deputies found M unresponsive in a cemetery, a two mile south walk from the ping, but it was too late. It was the first person I'd ever lost and I beat myself black and blue replaying all the calls in my head. Everything anyone had ever said, everything I did, did I do everything right? Was I fast enough? What if I were faster? Did I miss something that could have helped find her in time? We had a picture of her in our system and I dreamed about her for at least a week. Tonight I get a call from a suicide hotline advising of a male with a sharp object walking through town with the intent to end it all. That night with M came rushing back and I started to get almost nervous but also was determined that this one would be different. I pinged the phone and got officers moving, looked up his file to see where his past incidents had occurred for maybe a clue of residence. I even got a tracking dog to try and locate. As I'm on the phone requesting my third ping update, an officer calls out with him and he's okay. He's emotionally upset, but physically okay. And I felt the air go out of me. Once they cleared, I had an officer come in and watch the comm so I could step outside and I felt like a weight had been lifted off me. I saved this one. I felt like crying and I don't know if that's normal. Maybe I'll actually sleep tonight without seeing M's face. I know it sounds like a pointless story, but no one really understands what my career is or what goes on with it. I just needed to share it with you all. One time when I was out camping with my family in Northern Idaho, Panhandle, a few years back, my dad and I were the last two people up sitting around the campfire. When he looked up at the sky and said, whoa, what is that? I looked up and saw this yellow light zigzagging across the sky. It was far too high up to be a drone. And it was making such quick back and forth motions across the sky that it seemed impossible for a human to be able to survive traveling like that. We both watched it until it went out of our eyesight. Seemed like maybe a minute or so that we were able to watch it traveling like that. We both couldn't figure out what it might be, perhaps an unmanned drone, but there aren't any large cities or anything nearby for hours. Maybe it was some type of secret government test or something. Maybe that's why they were flying it out in the middle of nowhere late at night. But let me know if you have any other ideas. The other sighting I had was on the 4th of July, a few years prior in Southern Washington, near the Idaho border. Before the fireworks show started, my friends and I noticed this purple stationary light high up in the sky. Again, way too high to be a drone. And it looked kind of like a star, only purple. We thought this was strange 
and commented on it throughout the night, and other people around us did too, but it stayed stationary throughout the whole fireworks show. But once the fireworks ended, it took off very quickly in a straight line and just zipped out of sight. My friends who were with me all witnessed this as well, and none of us could figure out what it might have been. Both times I saw the UFO, and I was with someone else who saw it too, so I know it wasn't just me. If anyone has ever seen anything similar, please let me know. I am a 25 year old female, and this happened about two and a half years ago, in the winter of 2017. My girlfriend and I were living in the center of a popular and busy street in England, in a ground floor flat. The street we lived on was just off a very busy road that had about a thousand pubs on it, so it was normally quite populated most hours of the day. The flat we lived on was about seven in an old converted bakery. There was a very large locked wooden gate with a buzzer and the flats were all in a courtyard behind the gate. We shared the flat with my mum. Our bedroom windows faced directly onto the street where people would walk past on the pavement. On this given night, it must have been about 2 a.m. My girlfriend and I were laying on my bed watching a film on my laptop. My bedroom, like most UK bedrooms, was a tiny shoebox sized room with a bed and a wardrobe and about five square feet of extra floor space. Comfy. My window was right next to my bed and faced out onto the street. As we were laying on my bed, someone knocked on the window. That wasn't unusual. I had quite a few friends that lived and worked near my flat, so we didn't think much of it. We continued watching our film and settled down. And about half hour to 45 minutes later, there was a massive bang on my window that sounded like someone slammed their fists against it and ran off. We were a bit startled and decided to go take a look outside as it was evidently not one of my friends at this point. We went into the courtyard and opened the main gate and couldn't see anyone on the street at all. It was freezing and snowing, but still unusually quiet. We stood there for about five minutes, just looking around. I noticed a small man on the other side of the street wearing a mid-length trench coat and heavy boots. But as my eyesight is awful, and I never wear my glasses, I didn't actually see any discerning features. He was on the opposite side of the street, and I was walking along the street from the main road, from left to right, up towards our flat. I just got a bit of a strange vibe from him, and pointed him out to my girlfriend. We both just stood and watched for a few minutes, and as he passed, he didn't turn to look at us or anything. After less than a minute, I looked to my right and saw that this same guy had now crossed over to our side of the street and was walking towards us. My girlfriend and I watched for a minute and then proceeded to panic and shut ourselves behind the gate. Instead of going back into our flat, we crouched down out of sight so we could watch through the gap under the gate to see if he passed by. The thing I remember the most vividly is the sound of his boots creaking on the snow and watching him come to a dead stop directly outside the gate. My girlfriend and I were both now suitably crapping ourselves and were quietly hurried back inside. Our flat had an open plan kitchen and living room with a door that led to the straight hallway. My bedroom was right off at the end of the hallway and my mum was off to the right. All the lights were off and I poked my head into the hall and I had a clear line of sight into my bedroom from there. When I looked, I could see the silhouette of this man pacing up and down slowly outside my bedroom window. My mum had slept soundlessly through all of it, but I decided to go in and wake her up to let her know what was going on. She brushed it off until I told her to look outside, and she saw this man now pacing back and forth outside her window and mine, knowing that at the right angle you could see through my blinds from outside. I pressed myself up against the wall and scooted my way down the hallway back to the living room and rang the police. My girlfriend and I weren't really sure what to make of the situation, but it felt pretty ominous. The police arrived not 10 minutes later, met me outside and said they found him. He claimed to be homeless looking for a place to stay. 
but he was very well dressed and clean shaven and had no other possessions with him. The police officer offered forth the fact that it's more likely he was intrigued by the fact that there were two obviously queer young females in bed together and he was having a little snoop, but who knows. The next day I was outside having a cigarette with my girlfriend and I noticed a very prominent sticky handprint on my window. You know, as if someone had their hand pressed up against it? No, thank you. My girlfriend swears she saw him at the train station a few months later. So trenchcoat man, let's never meet again, you absolute creep. This happened about 11 months ago when me and my wife got married in June. I'll never be so grateful that I have a habit of locking doors. Our wedding day was coming to an end. Family and friends were slowly starting to depart as me and my wife Diana took pictures and chatted with some of the guests who stayed a little longer and were just having a good time. It was a great day and a lot of fond memories were made, but what we least expected is what happened that night as we were on our way to our honeymoon. As me and Diana said goodbye to the last of the guests at around 9pm, we got into the car and headed home. We had our bags packed prior to the wedding day for Cancun and we're ready to go. I live in Washington and we were in a bit of a hurry because instead of flying out from Seattle airport in SeaTac like normally people do, it was a lot cheaper for us to drive up north to Canada and fly out from a Canadian airport. Also, me and my wife thought it would be fun to have a little road trip to Canada and then fly out from Canada to Cancun. Plus it was only a three and a half hour drive for us and cheaper, so we headed out. We had a great time driving, blasting music, talking about Cancun, and just being excited about the new chapter in our lives. Diana slowly started to fall asleep, being exhausted from the wedding and whatnot. We were halfway to Canada, and at this point we no longer were in a city area, but more of a wooded area with much fewer cars and less people. The more we drove, the less we saw. At this point, there was basically no one on the road. By the time it was around 3am we had some extra time on our hands and I was starting to fall asleep too so I pulled over at a gas station to grab a Red Bull to keep me awake. As I pulled in I noticed it was completely empty. I was the only car parked and I saw Diana asleep. I told her I'm taking the keys and locking her inside and that I'd be right back. I wasn't sure if she could hear me but she kind of motioned her hand like normally people do when they're too tired to care. I came back around six minutes later to find my wife shaking and crying. I was confused and freaking out a bit because I wasn't sure why. She couldn't even get words out at first and after she calmed down a while later, she relayed the following. Apparently she did hear me when I told her I'd take the keys and be right back. And as she was sleeping, she was awoken by a tapping on the driver's side window. Being too tired to get up or even open her eyes, she lazily went for the unlock button on the passenger side door. As she was going for it, she froze. A thought passed her mind and then she remembered. Didn't he say he had the keys? Why would he need me to unlock the door for him? That's when she heard a woman's voice mumbling for the driver's side. She turned herself around to look at the window and saw a woman with long black hair, with wide eyes and a crooked smile on her face. She couldn't hear what she was saying at first, but then it became clear. She kept repeating in a mumbled tone, are you tired? Over and over. She freaked out and told the woman to leave her alone. The woman laughed and told my wife that she was tired too. The woman never took her eyes off her and tried the door handle. At this point, my wife was close to tears and attempted to call me, but as she did, she heard what sounded like a phone buzz and realized I'd left my phone in the car. Out of options, my wife started honking the horn, trying to scare the woman off, while perhaps also getting my attention. The woman still had her gaze on her and started mumbling more while laughing and trying the handle again. Then she mentioned something more about someone called Sarah and asked my wife if she knew her. After a few more mumbles, she left. To my wife's words, the minute she left, 
I came out the gas station. So my wife broke down. I don't know how I didn't hear the honking of the car, and I still feel bad for leaving my phone. My wife also added that one of the creepier things about that woman is that she didn't look homeless, nor dirty, nor anything. In fact, she seemed perfectly normal and well kept. My wife said she'll never forget the woman's wide eyes and the gaze she had on her with the smile. It also chills me to think what would have happened if my wife never realized that I had the keys or if she never heard me about locking her inside and open the door while facing the other way. I don't know what those women's intentions were, but if I couldn't hear the honk of the horn, I'm not sure I'd hear screams. To this day, I'm thankful I have a good habit of locking doors, and I'd recommend it, no matter how long you think you're going to be gone. This happened on New Year's Eve in 2016, in Ixtapa, Mexico. My family and I go there every year to spend the holidays since we own a little apartment there, and it allows my dad to escape his work environment, just for a little bit. The apartment we own is in an apartment complex which has 24 apartments total divided into four towers. They all look like the same and have the same small terrace with a small hot tub in the corner. Since we've owned the apartment for a few years, my parents became close friends with a lot of the other residents, which created a nice environment to be in during the holidays. On New Year's Eve, we were invited along with many of the other residents to spend New Year's at one of their apartments and roughly 35 people showed up. The apartment is on the fourth floor and we arrived there around 10 p.m. since many of us had dinner before with family and joined to celebrate the new year for the rest of the night. Around 11 p.m. one of my mother's friends looked up into the sky and said she saw something strange. Many of the residents being included shrugged it off and kept talking. But within a few minutes, more and more people started looking up. Once we saw the commotion, we got up and went outside to the terrace to join them to see what the fuss was about. It was strange at first, but I can describe it. It was as if the stars were twinkling. We could see stars, but they were bunched up closer than usual and were twinkling intermittently in an unusual fashion. As we kept looking, more and more stars kept showing up and twinkling. Some said they were stars and we were staring at nothing. But then what we thought were stars in the sky began to move towards the other stars that were twinkling. At this point, we all started to freak out a little. I like to think that we are not alone and that there are paranormal forces out there, but this was truly the first time I had no idea what was going on. There were too many to count, but we all agreed between 100 to 150 stars were twinkling in this one section of the sky and more seemed to move across in the sky to join them. Once they stopped joining, they continued to twinkle in an unnatural way. I can just explain it as turning lights on and off, and not the slightest dimness you see when looking at an actual star. Then this entire cluster moved across the sky and vanished from sight. We were all with our mouths wide open. Many of us tried to record or take pictures, but nothing showed up on the phone cameras, especially not that far away. The fact that it was 35 or so people witnessing this only about an hour after we got there means that we saw what we saw. No one was intoxicated to the point where they could have imagined it. The most interesting part is that the son of the apartment owner said that the year before he talked to a guy that said he had seen something similar on New Year's Eve the year before. He said he listened to his story but shrugged it off as some guy ranting. My family and I continue to talk about it to this day we immediately tried to investigate about phenomenons or events that could have caused this. I'm not sure if this is the right place to share this, but I don't know where else. If anyone has had anything similar happen to them or know what this is about, I'd really appreciate being informed. My husband and I were on a road trip coming back to Louisiana from Iowa. We would drive in four hour shifts while the other person slept in the back of the car. It was 3 a.m. and he woke me up to start my shift. I looked around and didn't see another car in sight or even a street light or building. He had taken an alternate route that he thought would be faster. 
Finally, we come across a small local gas station with a single light on. It was closed and our car was the only one there. We pull over and I'm getting ready to open the door so we can switch places and my husband tells me to hold on. I look up and from behind the back of the gas station, a man wearing rags shambles towards us quickly, not quite running, which made it even scarier in a zombie-esque way. I told my husband to hurry and drive away. He was intrigued though. He just stared ahead at the guy as he got closer and closer. And I started freaking out and screaming for him to go until he did. As he drove away, I looked behind us at the gas station as it disappeared into the distance. As far as I could see, the man followed the car at the same odd pace he was walking at until he could no longer be seen. Gives me chills big time. About five years ago, I was volunteering in a listening service that was only aimed at helping children of up to 18 years old. A lot of training was required for this role. Even though it was an anonymous phone call service, if a child presented us with a dangerous situation and we had their permission, we could call the appropriate authorities, like police or social services. After a few weeks, I was feeling settled in and had taken many calls. The majority were just kids joking around, but there were many tough calls too. Most evenings after I had finished my shift, I would feel so overcome with emotion that I would fight back tears on my way home in my car. Having a small child of my own often made it harder to forget about. One phone call in particular really startled me, and to this day I often think about it. It was about 9.45 p.m., 15 minutes before my shift ended, and I was sitting around. I hadn't taken a call in over an hour, and time seemed to be moving so slowly. My phone rings, and a petite, soft female voice says, Hello. I introduce myself, giving a fake name as I always do, and tell her a little bit about the service, and what we would do if someone is in danger. She says almost immediately, I need help. I'm babysitting my younger sister. She's only two months old and I'm nine. She's diabetic. She's turning blue. My mother and father have gone out. Please help. I felt as though all my training had gone out the window. I was panicking, but tried my best to keep my thoughts clear and my voice clear. Go outside and get help. Go knock at the neighbor's house and call the nearest adult you see. The little girl talked me through her steps and said she had the baby in her arms and was about to go out the street. Listening to the noise of the traffic and the sounds of the night air, my heart was beating so fast, aching to know what was going on and feeling so helpless. I could hear the little girl speaking to someone but couldn't make out what was being said. Next of all, a lady came on the phone. I have them. Hello? Hello, I have them both. I'm gonna take them to the nearest hospital. I thanked the lady and she told me that help was on the way. I ended the call and gathered myself. I informed my supervisor. She was as shocked as I was when I gave her the details. She called the hospital in the area that the girl had given me and also the police. And after an hour of filling in the mandatory documents, my supervisor followed up the inquiry about the call we had received. And they said they had no such cases. Finding it quite strange, we finished off writing the notes and shut down for the night. It wasn't until next shift the following week, which I was grateful for, as I needed the time off, when I returned to work after my week off. My supervisor called me into her office and informed me that she had gone through my notes on the call I received and had gone to search the system for the similar scenarios and keywords. She told me that every caller has a profile and the girl who had called was a frequent caller, and that she wasn't a little girl, but a lady in her early thirties in a psychiatric hospital, and she likes to pose as different people, but mostly as a child. This creeped me out, considering the nature of service and the fact that an adult was abusing it. This information angered me and also disturbed me. I felt silly and naive, as I had believed this girl's story. Over the next few months, she called a few more times under different descriptions and always posting as a vulnerable person. I wasn't there for much longer. 
but that story always gives me the creeps whenever I think about it. Back in 2002, after a day at work waiting tables, me and my friends were out in my front yard, three friends to be exact. I was 20 years old at the time, and also I had a two-year-old black Labrador retriever. The skies were clear, the stars were visible, and it was October in central Kentucky. The grass in the yard had dew on it. So my friend and I were smoking some weed, not the strong kind, and we were chatting and talking about work and girls and stuff. My dog was fetching a football. Being very young, she was still quite wild. So we kicked the ball and she would run full speed to grab it while sliding several feet across the yard. We'd probably been outside 15 minutes or so, and my dog was bringing the ball back the whole time. She dropped the ball at my feet, then looked straight up into the sky, which dogs never do unless you're holding something above them. She stared for five seconds, then went back to attacking the ball. One of my friends said, what did she just look at? So we all looked around the sky and another friend said, Oh my God, what is that? So we saw it. Something in the sky. Against a dark black sky, we could clearly see something very large and circular. The thing is, it didn't move. It had no lights. Against the clear sky, though, you could see it. I'd say it was made of a dark brownish gray color. You know it was night, so we couldn't see what it was exactly. But we could see that something was definitely there. One of my friends freaked out and consequently left. Being mesmerized by this, we started sharing stories and whatnot, and after several minutes, we noticed two more things in the sky. They were the exact same color against the sky, but the second and third were about a quarter of the size of the first. If you were to connect the dots with them, it made a perfect triangle. We stayed outside for another hour, and the things in the sky never moved. And after everyone left, I came back out with my video camera. But you just couldn't see them on the video. We still talk about this night to this day. It's not the best story, but there was definitely something up there. The kicker is that the dog was the one who noticed it. A puppy who was wildly sliding around the yard chasing a ball. Unless one was looking for something in the sky, one probably wouldn't notice these things. I don't know. I just know that there were some things in the sky sitting there, and against the black nighttime sky there was a brown greyish colour. And please don't say we were on drugs and that we imagined it, because we all collectively saw them. I spent nearly a decade working with a large law enforcement agency in my home state as a police dispatcher. Instead of answering calls made to 911, my job was to remain in direct contact with and consistently provide information to officers and other first responders. During a specific graveyard shift with very few calls in it in its entirety, I dispatch officers to an escalating yet non-physical domestic dispute. In short, it concerned child custody, which can undoubtedly shorten tempers and set parents on edge. A father had violated the hours of his visitation rights by showing up intoxicated at two in the morning at his now ex-wife's house. She, of course, was not too pleased, prompting the emergency call when he refused to leave. Normally, the response time for emergency incidents is based upon a priority system, depending on the circumstance and whether or not a person is in imminent danger. However, since it was a slow night with no incidents holding, I dispatched two available officers immediately. They arrived within minutes, separated both parties involved, and de-escalated the situation. As previously mentioned, the father was legally intoxicated, according to an administered breathalyzer, and had driven his truck to his ex-wife's house. But since he had legally parked on a public street and wasn't behind the wheel when officers arrived, he wasn't charged with drunk driving. I ran his information and background, and except for a prior DUI, driving under the influence, and a couple of minor offences, his record was otherwise clean and he didn't have any warrants out for his arrest. The primary officer, writing the report, that happened to respond was the patrol shift supervisor, my sergeant, a very nice man who earnestly tried to help every citizen he could, including cutting them some slack 
if an arrest was avoidable. He let the man off with a trespass warning and even gave him the opportunity to cause someone to drive him home or use public transport and return for his truck the next morning after he'd sobered up. Incredibly gracious considering the circumstances. This wasn't good enough. The man opted for an Uber driver and the officers left after one had arrived. Apparently the father had told the Uber driver to drop him off just around the next corner and proceeded to call 911 again, demanding to speak to an officer. My sergeant was made aware of this and asked me if I would call the man back to see what else he wanted. Since it was extremely common for dispatchers to make callbacks, I had no problem with this request. The father proceeded to berate me at the top of his lungs, and I'm going to censor the incoming profanity. He called me, amongst other things, a worthless piece of trash, and he said he called me to help, but that I was siding with the woman, and to send the officers back now. I'd heard these expellatives hundreds of times and was unfazed. I'm sorry you feel that way, sir, but I can send officers back to you. What's your location? He proceeded to call me every name in the book, including several racial and homophobic slurs and asked me, what's your location? Never mind, I know where your building is and I'm heading over there to mess you up, amongst other insults. He informed me that he had utility chains and gasoline in his work truck and threatened to not only blow up our communication center, but drag my burning body around the parking lot behind his truck. Sir, I understand you're upset, but I advise you not to make these kind of threats. Everything you say is currently being recorded. He replied saying, you think I give a hoot? Send your officer back out here and I'll string them up. Go ahead. I happily and maliciously complied. I informed my sergeant over the phone of the father's allegations. He, as well as five other squad cars responded. They found the man waiting by his pickup truck, back out in front of his ex-wife's house. I'll admit this guy had a pair on him. He was promptly arrested for the following violation of a trespass order for reappearing at the house, misusing of an emergency line, harassment of public safety employees, i.e. for threatening a 911 call taker, terroristic threats for threatening to blow up our building, and resisting arrest once he was placed in cuffs. In summary, tread carefully, deadbeat dad. I'm armed with a phone, a radio, and a criminal database, and a patrol sergeant, and I'm not afraid to use them. I went on a walk one night with my cousin and a few of our friends. We simply went walking up and down the streets of our neighborhood to the connecting one. We didn't even branch off any external forests or wilderness or anything like that, just using well-lit streets to travel by. We walked for 30 to 40 minutes when they wanted to return to the house to play video games or watch a film. I decided to stay out when they were walking back. It was a beautiful night and I love looking at the expanse of open sky. However, the thing I saw in the sky that night would forever keep my mind open to such strange and peculiar possibilities of this multiverse in which we live. I was seated on a huge decorative boulder. The designs of the neighborhood placed five or six of these beauties on a field of grass which separated the main street from the cul-de-sac. As I sat on this thing, I placed the crystals in my pocket onto their larger sibling and began to meditate in the cool nocturnal breeze. I watched my friends disappear around the corner in the adjacent neighborhood, and after five or 10 minutes, it came hovering by. At first, I didn't see it. I heard it. Before anything came into view, I heard the most bizarre, unsettling, and yet stimulating tone. I couldn't fathom what I was hearing, nor would I ever hear anything else like it to this day. It sounded like a low, bassy hum, mixed with a piercing tone in the middle of bass. It produced this noise like a binatural beat in the sense that it reverberated or pulsated, sort of like a subtle dubstep wobble. A different way to describe the piercing noise is a whistle mixed with the buzzing and zapping of an electrical current. Then as the noise got progressively louder and more disturbing, it came hovering over the tops of tall pine trees. It was small, 
An unknown vehicle flying so low it almost brushed the tops of the pines, and I still have never seen anything like it. It looked futuristic, and at that moment, even without putting words into my mind, I figured what I was looking at was some sort of alien craft. It didn't look like a drone or flying saucer, but like something else. It was elongated like a drone that had no discernible properties. It seemed to just float all on its own. All the while I'm rubbing my eyes, making sense of this strange thing, but the noise just went on and on. I could tell there was a sound to its mechanisms of flight, but it seemed like it had speakers on, playing additional noise. The thing I noticed about its pulsating sound is how it made me feel. As I sat and watched, the combination of looking at its odd appearance and frightening sounds made me feel very out of place. I suddenly felt this splash of energy within me that felt like it opened my mind and body to a vast and unlimited expanse, if that makes any sense. I wasn't contemplating any additional ideas. I was just observing it and the weird psychedelic stimulation it was giving off. Eventually, though, it went far enough away where the sound went faint. I didn't even think about how long I stayed there watching it, but it ended up being around 10 to 15 minutes to be far away enough where it was out of range. Was I the only one who saw it? I looked around where I was alone, but some other people must have seen it on its path far away from me. I know what some people are thinking. It was a drone and nothing more. Oh, let me tell you this was not a drone. It was something way beyond our scope of conscientiousness. After that night, I tried to tell people what I'd seen, but most tried to debunk it, or really didn't care. The cognitive dissonance it gave me that night has given me the knowledge that we are not alone, and we haven't been for a while. There are things in this cosmos that are stranger than fiction. Just because we've never seen something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. We're sitting ducks in this galaxy, and anyone could be watching us beyond the scope of our singular planet. I am a 19 year old female, measuring approximately 5 foot 4, and I live in a relatively safe part of my city in Ontario, Canada. This happened last summer. You see, I usually use Uber Eats or a food delivery service akin to that when I want fast food at night, as I can't yet drive. It was summer, and I live about a 25 minute to 30 minute walk away from our downtown area where there's the Wendy's and McDonald's, etc. It was still pretty light outside and was going to be so for a while. So I figured I'd just walk to get some food and save some money and get exercise. My boyfriend who lives half hour away from me and is quite overprotective of me, especially since I've had a bunch of creepy encounters before, was against my little outing, but I assured him it was light out and I would be messaging him the whole way. I'm about 20 minutes into my walk in a pretty open area with a field that leads into downtown next to a usually busy road, but it was kind of empty and slow at the time. The long stretch of sidewalk I'm walking on has a chunk of apartments on the other side of the street that loops around from the top to the bottom of the stretch of sidewalk. I'm getting to the beginning of this long stretch before downtown when I hear something behind me and turn to see a guy kind of sketchy looking, trailing behind me on a bike, riding on the road next to the sidewalk I'm on. He smiles and says hi, so I smile but said nothing and kept walking. I had one headphone in, but turned my music off once I noticed something else was near. After that little exchange, and an awkward few seconds of him still being behind me, he speeds up and bypasses me and goes down the road that leads only to my right. I've been texting my boyfriend this whole time, so I tell him about this strange little exchange, and he immediately tried to make some jokes that make me feel less weirded out, as I'm easily put on edge by people I don't know, especially males, as I've had a number of bad experiences, and I'm quite small in stature. After texting and walking some more, I dropped the topic, and heard a noise behind me, and it's the same dude. But this time, he starts riding slowly beside me as I walk. This is all purposeful. And from this point on, everything that happens I'm relaying to my boyfriend. The guy says hello again, and asks why I'm out so late, as by this point the sun is setting. Now my guard is immediately up. I'm small, walking alone, and it's getting dark, so I wanted him away from me. 
Even though I live in Canada, the province slash city where I live is dominated by the English language, and very few people can understand, let alone speak French. But lucky for me, my mum forced me into French immersion from kindergarten, and I've kept up with it all through school, so I can speak both English and French pretty well. I decided to just say a few words in French to make it seem like it was my only language. I've done this a few times when I needed to get the stranger off my back, but this time it backfired. After realizing I apparently didn't understand what he was saying, he rode off. But very soon after, I heard him behind me again. I figured he looped around the apartment again and got behind me quickly. So I turned to look at him to let him know I knew he was there. This is where my plan backfired. He rides up beside me again, saying something along the lines of, so do you understand me? And I just kept speaking a few words in French here and there, hoping he would get the message and just leave. I start to just stare straight ahead and move away from the road some more. This disgusting excuse of a person starts to tell me a lot of terrible and abhorrent and mainly gross sexual things he would love to do with me while riding alongside me. I'm kind of frozen, just walking there, texting my boyfriend everything that's going on and beg for him to call me. As soon as my phone rings, I pick it up and try and sound as normal and calm as possible while my boyfriend is freaking out. After being on the phone a little while, I stop and turn around. I was holding in many tears and voice cracks until I knew the guy was gone. He didn't turn around to follow me more. He just rode off after and I turn around and walked the other way. I waited, I was sure I was out of his sights before I booked it while sobbing on the phone to my boyfriend who was also shaken up and feeling helpless as he was so far away. Eventually I calmed down, but it did shake me quite badly. And after an hour or so of calming me down and asking if I wanted him to come by as it was a long drive and he had to work the next day. But I told my boyfriend not to, but that I appreciated the offer. He felt awful and ordered me the food so that I would feel a little better. Anyway, creepy douche who felt the need to make me scared and uncomfortable on your walk just because I was craving some fries and a shake, I hope you fall off your bike. But one thing I simply must try and get you to understand is just how creepy it is to be so vulnerable in such a situation with no one to turn to, nowhere to go, and darkness enveloping you. It is incredibly uncomfortable and I hope he never does it to anyone. It's the summer of 2001, around July. I was living in a small town called Manville, about a 45 minutes of Vigaville, living with my half-sister and her family, on a corner lot with a huge yard that is hedged all around. One night during this hot summer evening, I had an electric weed whacker which I was using to cut down the weeds in the driveway. That's when I noticed a man walking on the opposite side of the street. But he wasn't like any man I'd ever seen. His gait was very strange, almost like he was hobbling, but kind of leaning to one side. Red flags were going off, and my mind told me something was amiss. I didn't ignore it. Something was very different on this evening. He was dressed in a brown trench coat with a brown fedora on his head, as well as black sunglasses. I don't know why, but he caught my attention. And all I remember is he, or it, was looking at me as it went by. I'm not sure. I finished the yard and proceeded to put the weed whacker away with the cord. I thought this would be a good night to camp in the backyard in an orange tent. It was roughly 10.30 to 11 at this point. The sun had pretty much gone down and I had my CD player with me for music to listen to. A little round of dance music as I laid there and started to listen and relax before I fell asleep until things around me were making noise. It sounded as if someone was walking nearby perhaps. As I lay in my tent, I remember hearing the clicking noise like on the movie Signs with Mel Gibson. I start shaking and tremble, and I have to tell this story nearly crying. 
At the time this happened, my sister and brother-in-law at the time were all asleep. This alien, now that I think about it, was grey. I only saw the skin. You see, I was laying in my orange tent, and there's a little screen window on the side at the back. Then the face, all of a sudden, pushed its way into the tent. I saw the head. It was large and grey, and it had huge eyes. I couldn't say anything or move. I managed to squeak out a, hello, and there was no answer, just a clicking noise. I shut off my stereo and sat bolt upright and jumped out of the tent to confront this thing. I could have screamed in pure horror and shock. When I got out of the tent, I caught this gray creature moaning as it ran through the hedges of our house. Thank God the back door was unlocked. I ran inside and tried to wake up my sister, but she was out cold sleeping, so I hid in my nephew's room under the bed. I also felt so helpless. All I could do was watch the yard light up with a fuzzy pink light. By the time I fell asleep, I made sure the doors were locked and the windows too. Listening to this alien run around the house, the pitter-patter of its feet in the grass, I don't know where it went. I don't know if it ever returned to the yard, but that night was the scariest of my life. I never want to meet this creature again, and it makes me wonder what would have happened if I were actually asleep. I doubt I'll ever meet it again though, thankfully. One night as a freshman in college, I was making the hour long drive from home back to campus. I'd made the drive many times. It was a straight shot on a well-traveled, well-lit highway. So even though it was dark out, I wasn't worried about my safety. About halfway through the drive, I pulled over for gas. It was a brand new BP gas station with tons of floodlights direct off the highway with a good bit of people around. I walked in to get some candy and noticed a greasy looking man about middle-aged with dark hair and a mustache eyeing me up and smiling. I didn't read it as menacing. It seemed like he was just a simple country guy who smiled at everyone and I smiled back. I got my candy, paid for my stuff, turned and was about to walk out and said thank you to the person holding the door open for me. And a voice said, thank you. I soon realized it was the same man, but thought nothing of it. I got back in my car, locked the door, cranked the engine and leaned over the console to get my candy out the bag. There was a tap. I didn't even register it at first and then a tap again. Someone obviously was tapping on my window. I look up and saw it, the greasy smiling man. His hands and clothes looked even dirtier under the floodlights. He motioned for me to roll down my window. I remembered thinking he had to be at least 45. What was he doing approaching an 18 year old girl driving home alone at night? At first I tried to act confused and cupped my hand to my ear like, what, I can't hear you, hoping he'd give up. But instead, he cusps his hands around his mouth, presses up against the window and says, roll down your window. I don't know what else to do, so I cracked the window open a teensy bit. I had one of those old school boxy to who's and I was sitting up high. So our faces were pretty much at the same level and just a few inches apart. His fingers crawled up the side and slithered through the small window crack and into the car. I held my breath and tried not to freak out. He shifted his weight up onto the lift step and did a sort of pull up on the window to bring his eyes up to the opening. You wanna come play strip poker? Like any person in this scenario, it was a mix between confusion and being scared as hell. It was like a deer in headlights trying to figure out what the actual hell to say to this creeper that will get me out of here without meeting my end. The total genius I was, I said, <laughs> wait, what? I guess I was trying to stall, who knows. He repeated himself, but this time bounced himself on the car step, making my car bounce along with him. He laughed and peered at me through the crack again. His hands started turning white as he tried to push down on the window. Then there was a car horn and I thought someone was trying to help me. 
Nope. It was a bunch of his friends telling him to hurry up and get me to come with them. Come on, girl, it'll be fun. We won't bite. They all laughed. Ah, shucks. I'm sorry, but I really have to get back. Maybe next time, though. AKA, oh my god, what? Please don't kill me. Also, how is no one at the gas station seeing this and helping me? He reaches down to pull open the door handle, but thank god it was locked. And I still get chills when I think of what he said next. Aw, oh, come on, little girl. I bet you ain't never been with a real man now, sweet. The only tool in my toolbox at the time was the dumb girl routine, so I doubled down. Ha, <laughs> so funny. No, I really gotta go, but thanks, though. Y'all go have fun. I put my gear in reverse, hoping he'd take the cue to get off my car. Instead, he says, You sure, baby? Tilts his head, pushes his mouth into the window, and then forces his tongue inside, just smearing his spit slime everywhere, like a dip-scented slug. Uh, it's so hard to turn down. Thanks for the invite, though. I'm flattered. He lifts himself off the car and finally steps down. Your loss. He shrugs and walks back to the smoke-plumed jalopy full of his horrible friends. I burned rubber out of there, pulled onto the highway and called my friend, crying hysterically. Sure enough, I see them coming up right behind me. I could make out at least three men moving around and laughing inside, with exhaust fume and cigarette smoke enveloping their tin can on wheels. I sped up to around 85-90, hoping I'd lose them, or better yet, be pulled over by a cop. And after what felt like a long time, what was probably no more than a few seconds, did I look back, and fortunately for me, their vehicle was no longer there. I have no idea if I lost them or if they eventually just gave up. Moral of the story, don't be polite. You don't need that in your life, guys. Next time, I'll miss you in the face, weird tongue dude. I have a friend who was really into UFOs and stargazing like me, and he went down to Minnehaha Falls in Minneapolis, which is kind of right next to an airport. We were in the dog park area, so we were there for a little bit before sunset. There were all these old ruins that date back to when it was called Fort Snellings, like old school rock outposts. We found one and sat down on it. We hadn't seen each other in a few years because I moved out of state and we were only just catching up. By this time, it's night out, there are tons of stars, and we're smoking while stargazing. As we're looking, we see this really bright star, or planet we think. We're guessing as to which star or planet it is. We stargaze a lot, so we kinda knew what's what. We watch it for about five minutes. It's not moving, so we go back to smoking and chatting. Ten minutes later, I look back, and the light is gone from the place in which it was. Then I see this super bright light coming through the tree line, and it's over the Mississippi River. It was like going back and forth almost, like it was messing with us. Like we would move left to get a better look, and it would move right. Then this happened. We are in a field area, and there's a bunch of trees separating us from the river, with the light directly over the river, when all of a sudden, we see this super bright light come up from over the trees. One super bright light on the front of the craft, which was acting like spotlights, like it was going back and forth scanning the ground. So the spotlight in front of two dimmer lights is going back, so basically a black triangle, probably less than 100 yards away, completely silent to about 40 to 50 feet long on either side. So it comes over the tree line, scanning the ground and we're freaking out. And I say, we're totally gonna get abducted now, dude. We're shaking. So then the spotlight lands on us and we could feel the electrical pinches and goosebumps. Once the lights hit us, they cut off and it was just three dim lights on all three points. It slowly turned away from us and we could see like this exhaust coming out the back that I can only describe as a billowing invisible rainbow. It looked like if you were to drop oil in water, you get that kind of iridescent rainbow look. It slowly flew away from us and flew over the airport, the wrong way. 
made like an X with the runway. We watched it slowly over the horizon, sit there for a while and then went out of eyesight. By far the craziest UFO I've ever seen. It's really strange though, because that week in Minneapolis, they were supposedly doing test flights for stealth bomber planes, but this was no stealth bomber. Even those make some noise, especially that close. We looked up videos for the specific plane that they were testing and it definitely wasn't that. I honestly think they were probably man-made, probably military, right? One summer night about three years ago when I was 22 and a single mother, I had just left my boyfriend's house. It was the weekend and my daughter was with her father due to our arrangements. He got her on the weekends and I was not even halfway home when I figured that I'd stop at Sheets to get a nice coffee and some gas for the long ride ahead of me. With hardly anyone at the gas station, I pulled right up beside the pump and grabbed my purse so that I could go to the store and pay. I walked in and I paid for gas and coffee as usual. On my way out the store, I get halfway into my car and I get this feeling that someone is staring at me. I look over and see an older guy in his 40s getting ready to walk into the store and he's giving me the most messed up look that anyone's ever given me. I felt as if he wanted to do something bad. So I found myself walking quickly to the pump and as he was in the store, I'm filling up my car, I'm getting done jump in the driver's seat while he walks out and pull up to the stop sign and wait for the red light to change so I can go on since it's the main road. Meanwhile, I look over to see where the guy is and I see the guy hop into a car and turn around in the middle of the parking lot and get directly behind me. I start thinking to myself, what the hell? The lights change and I make my turn. I look in the mirror to see if the car turned my way and it did. The car followed me the whole way through town, which is a few miles, and I get to the end where I can either go straight to go home, which is about 40 minutes away from where I was, or turn right and go back on the 219 to get back to my boyfriend's. Just then I remembered that my mum had called me earlier to tell me that she and my stepdad were going somewhere and wouldn't be home till late. So I turn right and the car was still behind me. I call my boyfriend and tell him the car is following me and explain the situation. All freaked out, he stays on the phone with me. Meanwhile, I'm speeding down the road and trying to lose this person by purposefully hopping in front of other cars in hopes that maybe, by any luck, I would either lose the car or get pulled over. I look back in my mirror again to see if I lost this psycho when he's still behind me. My heart sank even further into my guts when I looked. About 25 minutes later and still on the phone with me, my boyfriend tells me he's gonna meet me at the bottom of his driveway. Then I tell him I'm almost there. I start to slow down so I can pull to the bottom of the driveway and see my boyfriend standing there waiting for me. Not a second later, the car that was following me starts slowing down almost to a dead stop until the person's headlights hit my boyfriend and they see him throw his arms up like, what the hell? Immediately the car gasses it and my boyfriend tries to make out the car as best he could since it was dark. It was a dark maroon colored car. I can't remember the model, but I remember the rims looked pretty battered. I was so anxious, but yet at ease that my boyfriend just saved me and that I was safe again in his arms. To this day, I still can't stop thinking about what would have happened to me if I'd have just gone home especially considering where I lived and how many miles away it was from the middle of nowhere. Even when your closest neighbors are Amish, no one would have been able to hear me scream. The person could have done whatever they wanted to me and I would have been completely alone. I am now 26, but when this strange incident took place, I was only a child. I can't remember exactly how old, I had to be eight or younger and it happened twice, not too far apart from each other. This was at a time in my life when I knew next to nothing about aliens or UFOs. I was aware of the science fiction genre, thanks to certain movies my parents watched from time to time, but I was not aware that aliens and UFOs may actually exist than compared to now, which would make my story that much more strange, especially since we're talking about something that happened in my childhood. 
I remember it being night time initially, and naturally as a child I had a certain bedtime. That said, with bedtime you can imagine children being prone to having nightmares. I was a bit restless trying to sleep, but when I do appear to fall asleep, that's when the strange stuff happens. I was appearing to be sitting on a concrete black top. There also appeared to be baseball hoops sitting at the edge of this black top. I'm not really sure why, but even as I write this 15 years later, I can clearly remember the details. I don't know if I was influenced to do so or not, but I did so by myself when I look over to my left and I see it. It was what I can only describe in present day as some sort of craft, an object, a UFO perhaps. Even stranger, it wasn't like it was just hovering high above the sky or anything, and it looked to be broad daylight during the scene. No, whatever it was, it was right there hovering maybe a foot or two above a black top. I would have to describe how this thing looked from my perception, but the exact dimensions of the strange UFO looking object have become hazy over the years. But it was black in colour, kind of shiny, perhaps possessing a metallic surface of some sort, and I remember that it did appear like it was a very large craft. If I referenced to the dimensions of said black top, which was actually a larger surface, the craft had a kind of unusual shape as well, and appeared both tall and wide, as opposed to having a thinner disc like appearance, although it was also a bit longer than it was wide. It started off slightly curved at the top before coming down widening outwards after creating a sort of 15 to 30 degree surface along the edge before it met the bottom. I can't remember if it was flat at the bottom or slightly curved like it was at the top, but it did have a slight edge as it met at the bottom. The weird thing is this craft just seemed to hover there, making a sound that was equally unusual. The best way I can describe the sound is it starts off with some sort of intake, like it was something to do with an engine, like the air was being taken into the craft but what followed was a sort of strange whirring rumble. Imagine the sound of a car engine passing by your house, but muffle the loud engine sound and give it more of a high tech sound. It's like a zooming sound, only it wasn't moving. It was just hovering right there in front of me within a close enough range that I could literally touch it. And now that I think about it years later, if this had been a UFO, I almost feel like those sounds must have been from the craft's power system, even if it's an engine and that it was the high-tech electromagnetic machinery I was hearing. This experience didn't seem to end with much else happening. It was like I was there to see this strange craft and then it was over. I can't remember how long it had been since the initial experience, but it definitely wasn't the same day. And what surprised me even more was the same or strikingly similar scene was how I was experiencing the second incident. The same black top, the same basketball hoops sat on it. Moreover, this strange craft was black. The same appearance and the same sound. Whether it was the same sort of UFO type experience or just a dream, it's hard to say. Since I didn't mention, I remember trying to sleep prior. And people tend to say it's difficult to distinguish your own dreams from something that actually happened. But this is something that makes little sense to me. Why as a child with little if any knowledge about aliens and UFOs would I suddenly experience such a thing? I could imagine it happened to older folks, but a child like myself at the time? I don't know, I'm not really sure what to think. This last Thursday night, I took a call of a woman screaming, oh my God, no, please don't, stop, screamed over loud bass and a car engine. She wasn't answering any questions, stayed on the line trying to get info for over six minutes until a male voice called her the B word for calling the cops and then hung up the phone. I pinged the phone, but it was moving too fast through multiple jurisdictions. And by the time I got the results on the first ping, it was already out of our venue. I checked previous history on the phone number, but there wasn't any. I ran the phone through a database we used to cross reference information on phone numbers, names, criminal records, and restraining orders, nothing. I also tried to get subscriber info so we could maybe contact someone who knows the owner of the phone, but it was a prepaid with no info on it. 
I alerted the highway patrol and the neighbouring jurisdiction, which is notoriously slow if I get any response at all. It took seven and a half minutes just to get to their emergency line. But without a vehicle description, it's pretty unlikely they're going to do anything about it. I mean, what are they supposed to do? Pull over every car with a loud bass in a particularly bad or high crime area? I continued plotting the recurring pings I set up, but they all stopped in one of the worst parts of the neighbouring jurisdiction, with a radius of 800 metres, basically three blocks containing 18 buildings, some with multiple floors. I tried calling it back a few times, but each call went straight to voicemail. Then my shift ended and I went home. I don't usually take calls home with me. Work stays at work is my motto, with maybe one or two exceptions. I shake it all off at the door, get in my car, and go be a good dad and husband. But this one's sticking with me no matter what. I could tell you what it's like to listen to a child tell you about his mom being beaten by his dad in front of him, and I had to testify in court about that call. I could tell you about listening to a family perish screaming in a fire after an accident. I can tell you that if someone is reporting an OD happening in front of them, it has a particular note of desperation unlike any other call, or what it's like to hear someone end their life on the phone with you or try and comfort an adult who's just found their parent deceased. I've listened to a mother scream as she realised she accidentally ended the life of her infant. I've talked to frantic parents whose children were taken. I've been at this job for a while, and I can tell you the time I spoke to a 15-year-old who had been shot and left for dead in a field because he tried to sell his older brother's weed. He survived or the guy who had been knifed multiple times and passed on the phone, with 20 seconds before officers and paramedics showed up. Those were the rough calls, but at least I had some resolution to them. This one? Nope. And I probably never will. Was it a woman being taken? Was her life being ended? Or was something horrific happening to her against her will? I have no idea. Could have been a partially disturbing song and a pocket dial for all I know. Was she found? Did she report what happened after? Is she alive now or is she in an abandoned building? I don't know. Is there someone frantically searching for her right now? Did I ever meet her? Maybe, but I will never know. Not knowing is the hardest part of this job. I go from the start of one emergency to another in seconds. Questions, dispatch, help, hang up and repeat. In the rare case something really bothers me, I can usually ask the officer via his computer how it went, but I think I've only ever done that two or three times. This call? I'll never know how it ended, or what happened. I did everything I could, only for it to mean absolutely nothing anyway. Now I'm sitting at home on my days off. My baby is crying. And my wife wants to tell me about some story or other she read on Reddit. Taxes are due, and I'm behind on paying bills a day or two. And all I want to do is go somewhere quiet, drink bourbon until I'm not stressed anymore. But that's a bad route to go. I've seen others do it, and I'd never forgive myself for letting my family down like that. So instead, I'm a little quieter than usual, and maybe not as attentive as I'd like to be. But I'll be fine for another day or two. Just gotta suck it up and go back to work. 15 years until retirement. Recently, my mum has been talking about me in my younger years, preschool to first or second grade. I don't recall, but my teachers said, according to my mum anyway, that I was an empath when it came to the feeling of other students, taking their pain as my own. I've always been able to feel the room, the house, the class, like some people's bones hurt before a storm. I've always picked up on the bad before it happens. I am by no means an anxious individual. These events did not impact my growing up. It was just kind of something on the back burner. If it feels tense, I feel it too. My parents are not very emotional people. My father being a lawyer, the mother a fitness instructor. You know, those types. This has not been talked about with my parents whatsoever, in fact. I wanted to just say, it's childhood, and kids distort memories. 
but it is the feelings that make these memories so vivid. I want to stress that I loved where I grew up. It was far enough away and tucked into a little corner that my parents were comfortable with me being outside for hours doing as I pleased. I loved the area and the house I lived in. The house was white with pillars in the front, overlooking about an acre of land filled with trees that has sat at the very end of the cul-de-sac. I've had the best room because it has the huge princess-esque windows that sat floor to ceiling and allowed the light from the room below the kitchen to the light up to my room, just a tad. And I could see the woods, the butterflies in the summer and hear my parents below me. It was the safest area possible. Now, this may have just been childhood paranoia, but it wasn't anxiety I was feeling. It was like waiting. I never once had a sense of relief growing up anywhere, whether it be at school or at home, preschool specifically. And up until elementary school, I remember checking all the doors one last time, asking mum if the alarms had been set the night before because of the things that I would feel in my room. I never told her why. Now, let me take you to the, your typical night. I would wake up in the middle of the night, whatever time it was, I was too young to have an alarm clock, to a feeling of dread. This happened for years. Through elementary school, the feeling happened infrequently, but just often enough for me to think, okay, here's that thing. Maybe if I don't move, nothing will happen. I'm sure everyone is familiar with the feelings of eyes being on you or being watched from afar. This is the feeling that would burn into me and would wake me and I would feel it as I lie there awake. As I've mentioned before, I've always been able to feel the room. The feeling of dread and guilt would hang in the air and all I could do was pretend I was somewhere else. Some nights though, I was brave. And when I looked up, beyond the curtain, my ceiling would be darker than black. My open windows that would usually illuminate my plastic stars were instead illuminating nothingness. Just imagine a funnel upside down, jet black, warping. That's what it was like to stare into. This cold and heavy black vortex over my head, over the room. I have memories pleading in the dark to come back a different night. And this is very profound. The begging and the returning. This happened for years. I remember pleading in my head to something to just take a different night. Although I don't remember anything ever past that. I don't know what you make of it. I think maybe, just maybe, it could have been what I experienced before I had an encounter with something unknown. Whether it be from this world or another, I cannot say. But that's what I felt like before the nothingness and passing out. I would love to know if anyone has ever had a similar experience to mine. Or is it just my five-year-old brain being dumb? I'd love to hear your thoughts. I was a police dispatcher one year in college for the campus police, Worcestershire Polytechnic Institute, by the way. It was generally really boring, a small nerdy school and not much happened. There was a sheet with codes on it. The codes represented certain kinds of calls. Though I didn't remember the code numbers nor what they represented, it might have been like code three is a fight, code 19, officer down, whatever. I took it upon myself to memorize the list. After a while, I had it down. Then I never needed to look at it again. One night, as I always worked third shift, an officer radioed in. Cone 42, Main and Elm, 33, Brock Road. Code 42? Hmm, I don't remember that one. Plenty of codes. Half of them were benign. They included common things like filling up your gas tank or noisy complaint. It wasn't always something horrible, so I wasn't too concerned. I casually looked at the sheet. How am I supposed to know what to do without it, you know? But I couldn't find it. Sometimes if it's a bigger deal and the other officers know they need help, they don't wait for me to dispatch them. Another officer will just say, I'm coming, that sort of thing. 
So when someone did that, I became alarmed. Then another officer did it, then another one. I was flipping out at this point. I had no idea what the problem was and I couldn't do anything. So I was going to call 911 and say, send an ambulance, something happened. And while you're at it, send a fire truck just in case. Someone was going to die. I knew it. And it was all going to be my fault for not knowing the code, not finding the sheet, and not having the guts to ask what it was. And then I found it. Scanned down at the bottom, 42 was the biggest number I'd ever heard. Dunkin' Donuts run. Those cops scared the life out of me. I am a fairly short female, and I was traveling alone in Madagascar at aged 21 because I was on placement at a hospital on Mauritius for a month and decided to hop across to see some lemurs, speak French, and visit another African country. I was obviously a complete imbecile, as I had no idea what I would be in for. I traveled with around 2,000 Australian dollars, which were useless there, as there were barely any banks and they wouldn't accept the Australian dollar checks, traveler checks, and almost no cash for safety, thinking a few family trips to Europe meant I was worldwide. Everything goes wrong. I'm followed on the streets all the time and harassed non-stop. I go to visit a tourist site out of the main town at 5 a.m. to avoid attention and get followed around by a self-appointed guide, a kid who tails me while trying badly to hide behind trees and then blocks my way and asks for payment as I try to leave. I pull out a crumbled $1 note and tell him I don't have more money because I'm scared of being robbed. He takes a look a bit incredulous, but lets me go. This time I've had enough of Dana and catch a bus to the countryside. I stayed at a forest lodge and go on a nighttime forest walk, which may be illegal, and the guide offers to use one of his bikes to explore the village the following day. His eyes are yellow because he gets malaria every year, and he looks to be in his late twenties, but appears more in his early thirties. Small, scrawny, and sick looking. I turn up to borrow the bike, but then he says how he's coming with me. So I sit where he tells me in front of him on the bike, with one broken pedal, and start to think how he's pressing against me deliberately. We cycle around, then make our way up a big hill away from the village. He walks off to speak to his friends and returns, and starts asking if I have a boyfriend and if I love him. I lie and say we are engaged. He asks if in my culture we can have two boyfriends, and the friend is looking at me as he asks this. We are not close to anyone or anything, and I ask him to leave, but he wants to stay. I feel really uncomfortable, so I grab the bike and dart down the hill. He has to run after me. At the bottom he points to a large field and tells me his dad lives in a hut on the other side, and he'll take me there to introduce us, and I say no. He tells me it's very offensive to refuse to meet family in his culture, and I say no again and we ride back. This time, me being on the front, pressed against while he doesn't speak. Back at the accommodation, which are canvas huts in the forest, the receptionist tells me that I shouldn't have gone with him, that he's a bad man and a drunk. Well, thanks for telling me now. I also ran out of money and started crying in front of two guys from Reunion who gave me $50, which was just enough to get a bus back to the capital in time for my plane. On the way back, around midnight, the bus stops in a field and two army guys with machine guns get on and start searching the bus. I'm the only foreigner and don't have my passport. I'm convinced I'm about to be arrested or questioned, but they're looking for a man on the run. Unfortunately, they leave me alone. I'm just gonna say now, my experience in Madagascar, being a single female and quite naive and young, was not the best. To any future travellers, please be savvy. One day I'm driving through the city centre in the UK, and stopped at lights in line of traffic. I was just looking around what was around me, looking at the buildings, cars, posters, when I noticed a really odd looking dude. I made eye contact, and his face seemed wrong, like it was almost perfect. I don't mean perfect as in handsome, but it had no signs of aging or any history to it. His face had a light complexion, fairly pale, but not unusually. 
and as smooth as porcelain. Not a single dimple, spot, blemish, scar or flush of colour. No facial hair apart from thin eyebrows that were perfectly level and mirror images of each other. They seemed too perfect for natural eyebrows. He had prominent high cheekbones and slender cheeks with a thin nose. He was facing the side of my car from across the street. We then made eye contact. It only lasted not even 10 seconds, but his eyes were just emotionless. A dull, pale blue, like doll's eyes. After this time, he turned 90 degrees on his heels and walked away in the opposite direction I was facing. When he turned, he had very defined jawline and chin. The slopes of his nose were also flat and their overall body shape was tall. During this whole interaction, there was no emotion on their face, no color or change at all. As soon as we made eye contact, it felt like it was a mistake. I had a feeling that I shouldn't have noticed him. It was unnerving. It looked to me as though I'd seen something that was only pretending to be a person like a human sized doll. I know for hyper realistic masks exist, but this was no mask. It seemed hard like a shell. I don't know. Has anyone ever seen anything similar? This story takes place in the summer after I graduated high school and I was working at a local gas station. There's more to this story than just being trapped by a customer, but it all builds up to it. This guy and his girlfriend used to frequent the store, but one day he came in by himself. He never gave me bad vibes before and his girlfriend was super friendly. On that day, I was dressed up since I was going on a date directly after work and he jokingly asked if I had a big date that night. Seeing as he had a girlfriend, I didn't think much of it and said I did. And it was with a foreign exchange student I'd been seeing. The foreign exchange student was leaving in two weeks. So we were trying to cram in as much time as we could. Well, me and my girlfriend broke up. So when that foreigner leaves, you should give me a shot. I was kind of shook because of how forward it was, especially since I just said I was seeing someone. I politely told him again I was already seeing someone, but thanked him. Little did I know this was going to make work hell for the next few months. He knew which car was mine because all of my co-workers said he only came in if I was working. They never saw him otherwise. Every time he came in, he would ask me out, try to flirt with me and generally harass me about how I looked. We made pizzas as well, and he would sometimes order a pizza and a bunch of other food and just stand there and talk to me while I made it. I once forgot a topping for him and he said, since I messed it up, I had to go out with him now. I said, no, but you do get a discount and left it at that. On the 4th of July, he offered to buy me alcohol if I went to a party at his place, but I declined. I was 18 at the time, so I wasn't old enough to drink. He literally wanted me to pick out alcohol I wanted at the store I worked at while I was on the clock. Once a man came in and asked, are you Fleur? When I said I was, he said, my nephew won't stop talking about you. He's definitely got a thing for you. This really got to me because why the hell was his family talking about me? I've never seen him outside this store, let alone spoken to him. I unfortunately had to work on my birthday and I didn't want to deal with people, so I took the stock job instead of register. My manager and my one idiot co-worker said happy birthday, and I headed to the cooler. While I was stocking the pop, I heard the cooler door open, turned around expecting to see my manager or co-worker, and this creepy guy was standing there. I was completely shocked since the door says employees only, and all that. I somehow stammered out why he thought it was okay to come back here, and he said he wanted to tell me happy birthday and that he had something for me. Now I'm absolutely terrified wondering how he knew it was my birthday and what the hell he had for me. He suddenly grabbed my wrist and dropped something into my hand. Before I could even see what it was, he was gone. I looked down and it was a small baggie of pot. I could only think, what the hell? I quickly went to grab my manager. The owner hates drugs and I didn't want to get in trouble, so I thought it was just best to tell him. I was shaking and crying, both because I was still scared, thinking about what could have happened if the guy wanted to do something else, and that I was gonna get fired for having illegal drugs in the store. 
The owner was furious, but he assured me he wasn't mad at me. He told me the guy was banned, and he told me I got to handle it however I wanted. If the guy came in, I would call the owner so he could do it himself, or I could tell the guy. I decided I wanted to tell him myself. Not sure why, maybe I just wanted to let all out the frustration of the situation. The next time he came in, I told him off. I told him that creeping on me for months was inappropriate, especially since I was at work and couldn't be rude about it to him. I told him that nothing was ever gonna happen and that he was a creep and he made me very uncomfortable. Finally, I told him he was a nutcase for coming into my store, seeking me out in an employees only section, basically trapping me somewhere where I couldn't run and giving me illegal drugs that could cost me my job and get me in legal trouble. I told him to get out and never come back. I know this last part sounds very fake, but it really did happen. And it felt really good to be able to get all of that out while I was at work. Not many girls get the opportunity to tell off their creeps, especially while at work. And now I was basically given permission to. I hope we don't meet again. Before I start my story, I'd like to say that I'm a complete skeptic and question everything and anything supernatural. I think extraordinary claims should always require extraordinary evidence. Even to this day, I will never be able to empirically prove what I've experienced. I'm currently 26 years old. This happened on June 16th, 2007. I remember it vividly. It was immediately embedded into my long-term memory when it all happened. In psychology, I believe they refer to these events as flashbulb memories. I was living in my parents' home at the time. It was a pretty stormy night. The wind was gusting slightly more than usual and rain was coming down violently. Your typical crackles of thunder and lightning. I was playing WoW at the time, enjoying the idea that I had a legitimate excuse to not go out and do anything. I was about to finish one of the longest chain quests in the game and boom, the internet goes out. I try for about half hour, anxiously, to get the internet to work. But as you guessed, nothing. I head to my room, frustrated. Here I am, home alone, with no internet, and irritated as hell. My parents at the time were out at a work-related event. And I remember lying on my bed, just staring at the ceiling, turning my head to look at my old retro alarm clock that read 06.18 p.m. When I heard three knocks, I immediately sprung up, my eyes wide open, startled as hell. I crawled to my window that faced the front door and heard three more knocks again. I peek outside my window and see that there are three tall men dressed in your typical FBI looking suits. One had what appeared to be a folder or file or something. Another, what I have believed to be a Geiger counter and the other was beating on my door with a huge fist. I head to the door, not really thinking much of it. I honestly thought that they were just church people soliciting their beliefs. I open the door and the one man nearest the door that was knocking greets me in a very monotone voice, pulls out a badge, and says that him and his colleagues need to check the water source from the house's faucet. I ask them a bunch of questions. It turns out that they were in fact the FBI, and someone had allegedly tried to poison the city's water. I called my parents to let them know what was going on, and they okayed the situation. The guys in the suits didn't even check the water in my house. They had some other group of government guys show up and check. I tried to ask them if there was a motive or if it was a terrorist or whatever it could be. They simply said they couldn't talk about it in detail. When out of nowhere, all the lights in the house go out. It's pitch black. The guys in suits tell everyone to stay calm. They think it's just a power outage. The guys taking water samples turn on their flashlights. As one of them does so, it flashes over the tallest of the suited men. I see a reflection from his face, almost as if there were metal from under it. The guy with the flashlight quickly directs the light elsewhere, 
When a moment later the guy with the flashlight says, Sir, it has begun. The suited guy with the Geiger counter turns it on. The thing just starts going haywire. And not three seconds later, it felt as if I were being pulled into a million different directions. I couldn't see anything. At first, it was just excruciating pain. I thought it was the process of being disintegrated alive when out of nowhere I see nothing but white. I literally thought that I was in heaven. A man appears to me and smiles, swings his arm in an inviting gesture, as if I were entering a ballroom dance or a party. I try to walk, but nothing. Then the white room gets sucked into itself and I see my life flash before my eyes and I see everything. Disneyland at five, my first kiss at 15, watch 911 happen on TV with my mom and my dad, everything. I see the earth suspended in space. I'm watching earth from above and I fall. I feel it, heart racing. I'm numb and in disbelief. I see the ground getting closer and closer and I know this is it. I know I'll die. But before I hit the ground, I hear the monotoned voice of the suited man say in my head, do not, and then a white static noise, no matter what. I woke up in my bed with cold sweats and panic. I freaked out and ran downstairs to find my parents cooking dinner. I ran back upstairs to see that it was 6.22 PM. I was relieved to find out it was a dream but it gets creepy. I go back downstairs and ask my parents when they got home. They told me they'd been home as it was their day off. I asked how the company event went and they said it was last week. I asked them what time I fell asleep. They told me they didn't know I was asleep. I go to my computer and find that my WoW account was logged in and where I left off before the internet went down. I checked for my computer and the date it was the 23rd. I have literally no memory of a full week. I tried to recall what had happened in my dream, but it was a blur. I go back upstairs and see that it looked like someone went through my closet. I searched and freaked out. The exact same Geiger counter the alleged FBI agent was holding was in my closet. I've never told anyone about this until now. I still have the Geiger counter and don't know what to do with it. I know this sounds crazy, but I've spent the last decade trying to piece things together. I just live day by day as an ordinary person, hoping they don't return. Around April, May last year, I was working third shift at a gas station as a clerk. I've always been incredibly aware of my surroundings. This was my last week of the job before I moved over to work for the county. As I was starting to have a really odd and creepy things happen to me, and I was getting worried about my safety overall. Around midnight, this rather young looking guy pulls up. He had several facial tattoos and was nearly bald and looked sort of off. He came in and asked to charge his phone, which I told him I couldn't but that he could use the store phone to call someone if he needed help. He asked me where another gas station was and I told him and he left. He apparently got lost, came back and just decided to sit there. He said he had car issues or something. I was tending to other customers when I noticed that he was throwing things out of the vehicle like clothes. I thought it was kind of odd, but it got worse when he threw away several expensive power drills at that point, I thought something was up because who in their right mind throws away a power drill? I called the police and informed them of what was going on and tried to give them a description of him as best I could as he had changed his clothes several times in maybe the two hours I'd seen him there. 30 minutes rolled by, which is understandable as my last place of employment was at the very cusp of the county and two officers pull up. He immediately goes over to one of the officers and starts asking for some help, which makes the officer give him a weird kind of look because he was right in the officer's car door. The officer asks him for ID. He goes and grabs it out of the vehicle, but later the officer told me he saw the man watching the two men through the glass window of the vehicle. 
Not even a moment later, he takes off running behind the vehicle into an incredibly wooded area. They both take off after him, but come back and they had no luck. They didn't find him. They proceeded to investigate the vehicle and take the items out the trash he'd thrown away. Eventually, another officer comes out as well and a tow truck and they all try and get into the vehicle as there's a small piece of paper covering the VIN and there's no tag on the vehicle. After they get in and they give the VIN back to dispatch, it comes back as stolen. At this point, I had my father sitting up with me at the store because I was frightened in case the man came back and tried to hurt me for calling the cops on him. It was about 4 a.m. and my boss was coming in to count the safe. Well, at that point, the cops left and the tow truck but I had my dad stay in the parking lot until I got off because my manager was in the locked office and I didn't want to be alone. Now this gas station was right off the interstate and the other gas station the man was trying to get to was also off the interstate about three miles west. When he ran, he ran east. I found out that day at some point during the night he had walked along the interstate, gotten to the other gas station and he stole someone else's vehicle at the other gas station. That gave me chills. As far as I know from talking to the original officer that he walked over to when they first got on scene, he was caught about a week later in a high-speed chase. But for my sake, creepy face tattoo guy, let's not meet again. I have taken a number of frightening, stressful, and disturbing calls as a 911 operator. These include, I watched my roommate end his life and he's still breathing. The roommate lived long enough to be transported but died shortly after. My husband has PTSD and he has a firearm. In that one, I managed to get the wife and child out of the house safely, but the husband didn't make it. Or the non-English speaker with the choking baby. There are delays in getting interpreters conferenced in Perhaps the sound of a gunshot in the background, but the list goes on. But the majority of the calls we process are routine. Even the emergencies we have, the cavalry at our fingertips, and the capacity in most cases to get the right help to the right location in the right amount of time. This means that heart attack dads, or car accident mums, or fighty drinky neighbours usually aren't even a blimp on the emotional radar. I don't say this to minimize the level of crisis for those involved, but it helps explain how we can be saturated without becoming, well, saturated. In reality, many of the calls that we have had haunted me and have been the unexpected or heartbreaking details in otherwise routine calls. The world wary eight year old, same age as my youngest, calling in a disturbance between mum and dad, telling me mum's a crackhead the guy at his Christmas tree lot who had just been robbed at gunpoint, telling me the bad guy just kept apologizing the whole time he did it. The elderly woman who on a routine medical call told me she wishes people who can still walk would get outside more and that she would give up anything just so that she could walk again. There are the calls I take home with me, as much as many high crisis type of calls, someday it's the best and worst of humanity. The rest of the time, it's just turtles all the way down. This happened in the mid nineties in the summer. I was around six or seven and my brother was around 11 or 12. Not quite a year earlier, my brother started telling my parents he was being followed by a triangle in the sky while waiting for the school bus. After a few days of this, my dad went out with him to see what was going on and they both came rushing back inside panting. They didn't tell me too much to keep from scaring me. Sometime in the next few days, the local paper puts a front page article about a big flying triangle going over the nearby town. Hundreds of witnesses and a few pictures of the lights as it was night. My mum cut the article out and kept it near the fireplace. So going back to that summer, we had this house down a little dirt road pre-removed from people. And while we had some neighbors, we rarely saw other traffic. My mum and I were sitting in the living room, 
and I was helping her fold laundry while Mash was playing on the TV. My dad and brother were out at the store for something, so it was just the two of us. I should point out that my mother does not get scared easily by anything but horror movies. She used to backpack in heavily wooded forested areas, known for its moose and wolf populations before getting more involved into the medical field and ended up as an EMT. I was not accustomed to seeing her frightened. So out of nowhere, this pristine, black, classic looking car pulls up into our driveway. No dirt anywhere. Both doors open up and out step these two men wearing all black suits and shiny shoes. Without looking around or pausing, they made their way to our front door. My mum scoops me up, ducks me around the corner into the kitchen while shh in me. I say ducks because she grabbed me so fast I barely had time to blink before I was tucked under her, sneaking form. She ran me all the way back to the back door, where we have our washing machine and second bathroom. The door to the bathroom is immediately across the back door but buried behind baskets and clothing. She effortlessly tossed all that crap aside and bolts us both into the bathroom with one arm around me and the other pulling the doorknob like it was holding us from falling. She was so hysterically scared. She was crying and spit was coming from the side of her mouth. I asked her who they were, but she just clamped my mouth with her hand the rest of the day is a blur. The next time I recall remembering bringing this up was the next day. I asked again who they were and she told me to be quiet. I kept bugging, but she kept telling me to shut up, which is very unlike her. When she finally said something in response, she had no memory of it at all. I felt lonely and a bit cheated. Both of my parents also somehow forgot about the triangle object after my brother saw it and the paper talking about it, and of course I couldn't find it. About ten years later, I found that article and right away showed my family, and they acted as if they had never forgotten. They recalled the whole thing without issue until I brought up the men in the cars. That is something that I only appear to remember. I was a Coast Guard Marine radio operator. The worst call I took was from a boater that witnessed a float plane crash into the ocean near a community not far away. The plane was owned by a company that one of my close friends is a pilot for. He slammed into the water at a 45 degree angle of full power. It was severely damaged on impact and ended up upside down and sank very quickly. It was clear after a few minutes there were no survivors. After the initial call from the boater that saw the plane go down and was heading over to help, I was inundated with calls from other vessels and mariners and was very busy for the next 30 minutes. And it was another hour after that before I was relieved from my position and could call my friend to find out if he was still alive. That was the longest hour and a half of my life. Other calls I've taken include gunshot victim at a dock trying to call very quietly so not to alert his assailant. A woman screaming and panicking after her husband collapsed on their sailboat. Mayday, mayday, we're up Point Pleasant and sinking. And then nothing. And a man in a panic reporting there was a drunken fight in a remote coast community and someone was struck in the head with a hatchet, which is now stuck in his head. I'm a 17 year old living in Darwin, Australia. I frequently have sporadic episodes of insomnia. I've deduced this to overall stress and anxiety. I mean, look at the state of the world, can you blame me? Despite this, I can recall troubles, sleep deprived from either nightmares or just general restlessness since I was a kid. So keep that in mind. My first encounter was on a camping trip with my grandmother to a dam reserve three hours from our town. During the holiday and weekends, families spent their times fishing, hiking, and doing other recreational activities. But during the week, virtually no one was there. So sometimes my grandma would take my brother and I for little excursions. I was seven or eight at the time. 
living in rural New South Wales. This time my brother didn't want to come, so it was just my grandma and me. The camping spot overlooked the water. Dead grey silver trees lined the shore. I remember very little about the trip other than this experience. We were in our swags or sleeping bags, looking at the sky. The lack of light pollution meant that the stars shone incredibly bright. My grandma was dozing off when I first saw the shooting star fly by over the Southern Cross. I nudged her to tell her. That's cool, she said, closing her eyes again. I saw another but decided not to wake her, then another and another. I woke her and she stayed up long enough to see a whole meteor shower. She joked, saying she nearly missed it because she didn't believe me. After 10 minutes, the shooting stars stopped and she closed her eyes for the last time that night. I stayed awake. I was just pumped that I had seen something so incredible. Then after failing to count stars, I saw a little orb of light appear on the left of the Southern Cross, bright white with a blue lining around the edge, about a quarter size of the full moon just sitting there. I'd heard about UFOs from my granddad and older brother talking about them from living in Alice Springs, but wasn't completely sure what one was at this point. Hell, I didn't even know that UFO was an acronym or that they had any affiliation with aliens. A minute or two of hovering stationary, it sort of started to slide left further, then sped up and finally darted off, leaving a thin light trail akin to the shooting star. Then, with a quiet crack, it disappeared. That was the first and only time I had ever seen a UFO. I didn't think much of it, but now I find it fascinating. Whether it had any relation to extraterrestrials was beyond me. The second experience was a much closer encounter with something that happened between three and five years ago. I am something of a night owl. Back in my early high school days, I'd stay up until 2 a.m. reading or watching movies or deciding that it was a good time to do homework. I came out of my room, put a mug in the sink after I finished my tea and used my phone's flashlight to see because I didn't want to wake my brother. The light was faint, but enough to see my reflection in the glass of the louves and notice a pair of orange lights. I looked behind me thinking it's some kind of apparatus or kitchen appliance but there was no light. I turned around, kind of crapping myself. The lights were closer, and I could see a faint, pale silhouette against the dark garden. I was kind of frozen in fear. All I could do was stare at these two hypnotic eyes of whatever was looking at me. It was almost like an animal's eyes, looking under a flashlight, but it had its own source. I was worried that any sudden moves would spook it or prompt some sudden movement from the creature. I was preparing myself to turn my back and Naruto run to my room, but was terrified it might chase me or come inside. As living in rural Australia, we don't really bother locking doors. No one breaks in. I felt we were staring at one another for the longest time, but it couldn't have been more than a few minutes, a minute and a half at tops. I counted to three, bolted to my room, jumped into my bed and pulled the covers over my face. I remember this ringing in my ears from the adrenaline and shaking from fear. Quite frankly, I'm surprised I didn't pee myself. I had to sleep with my light on that night and I regret not assessing how tall it was. All I can remember is a pale humanoid figure and those glowing eyes. A few months after this, I got up to open the curtains and louves of my room to let the cool, dry season air in. I felt the shock again, seeing the same pair of orange eyes staring back at me, this time behind a cluster of golden cane palms in the garden 15 meters from my window. This time I yelled in shock, startling the creature that sprang off into the night. Let me tell you how relieved I was that I didn't have to sprint to my room this time. I just had to leap into my bed. After this, I haven't seen anything like this again. This experience was pretty weird, and why I mentioned I have trouble sleeping. It could very likely just be my tendency to sleepwalk. On a couple of occasions, I've woken up in the lawn beside my house, 
Not sure why, but it's an awfully daunting feeling to wake up outside on the ground, somewhere you don't remember falling asleep. And even worse, with a small rock embedded in your arm. You know, like when it's been there for so long it just kind of sticks to your skin. I woke up because the rooster started going off. The sun had started to come up, but it was mostly dark still. And I went inside through the back door, which, by the way, was still open. I went to my room to resume sleep. The second time this happened was on the same lawn. I woke up startled because the sprinkler had started and I was sprayed. I felt this uncomfortable familiarity with the situation. I got up and went inside for my second shower of the day. I'd love to hear your thoughts on everything. Please, I want to understand. It was quite hot outside yesterday, and I was bored, so decided to go to McDonald's with my friend. Things were normal at first, and as I mentioned, the heat made me want to roll down my window halfway through the drive. Halfway there, we changed our plans and decided it would be best to go to Subway. I made a detour in order to get to the one closest. As I turned from a side street back onto the main one, I realized I had to make a left turn to get to the subway, so I looked to see if I could switch lanes into the center one for turning. Unexpectedly, there was a scraggy man crossing the middle of the street with no crosswalk in sight. Traffic was also especially bad since it was currently the College World Series season. He looked like a lot of people you'd find walking around aimlessly with dark, dusty looking clothes and a very worn looking red bag plus a bright red cap that covered his eyes. He seemed like he was on something too, since he had decided to cross such a busy street during prime hours. But I'm not so sure about that. Now this happens sometimes where I'm from, especially on this street in particular, and I'm used to it, so I slow down until they're safely out my way before I carry on going. With that I merge into the center lane, where he had already started to cross onto the other side. Mind you, I was nowhere near him, but he slowly turned around and started charging towards my car as if I had tried to ram him. He was yelling and cursing for some reason. I didn't know why he was angry. I quickly pulled up my window and made sure the doors were locked. As he got right next to my car, he knocked on my window while yelling at me to get out, but I kept on going since it was just my turn to leave. I heard a ton of honking and a lot more yelling as I turned into the parking lot so I assumed he had crossed the street and moved on with his day. However, before I could park, my friend told me that we should probably hightail it out of there because he was waiting for us to get out from across the street. Some cars were blocking my view, so I moved up a bit and sure enough, the red cap was there and he was glaring very intently at us. I knew something was wrong and that I could be in real danger and that feeling was enough to convince me that I shouldn't even entertain the idea of getting a healthy sandwich. So I made a turn and got the hell out of there, before something could happen to one of us. I knew that if I made a left turn, there was a stop sign right there, so my buddy would have to have become his target. So I went right and stepped on the gas. Lo and behold, I start driving away when I see this man actually attempting to run up to my car. He was yelling something, but my buddy turned on the AC so loud we couldn't hear it. Needless to say, I was freaked out of it at this point, so I kept driving, until I knew I was way out of range, even though there was no way the guy could catch up with us. I don't know how long he followed me for, because I didn't look back until we were a good five blocks away. I'm glad I know my streets though, because we ended up at the McDonald's we'd planned to go in the first place, and nothing mollifies me like a large fry. I thought about it for a while while I was eating, and was quite rattled. Who knows what he would have done if we had decided to park at the subway, or worse if he actually got to stick his hand into my open window like he'd been attempting to. I'd been warned that that would happen in the sketchier neighborhoods when I'd been learning to drive, but this was the first time I ever experienced anything like that, and when I was quite shocked. Who knows what he could have had in his pockets, or his bag and the look on his face was one that implied he simply did not want to apologize or exchange pleasantries on a Saturday afternoon. A few years back, 
while fishing on a large pond with my dad. We happened to see a few strange lights in the sky. We had a cheap pair of binoculars, so they didn't offer any help in visibility. The odd thing was that the area was very mountainous. Across from our location, there were two mountain tops, and each had a bright light seemingly hovering over them. They didn't move, grow, or shrink, just stayed a steady size and brightness. My dad the whole time kept fishing and drinking, while I kept a worrisome eye on them. I mean, last place I want to be is in the middle of a pond with aliens. Anyway, time passed and I can't remember if before or after, but at one point, a pointed ship flew across the pond. It was more centered on the pond than out in the distance like the orbs, and a while later it flew back the opposite way. Now here's the oddest part. Eventually the balls of light began to come towards us one last time. The first one made no noise whatsoever until it was over us. At that point, it suddenly just looked and sounded like an airplane. It has never sat well with me that these were just planes flying towards us. I've seen plenty of planes in the sky at night and they make noise, move and aren't bright star color. Also, how they both managed to fly directly over our boat at so low altitude seems so odd. We weren't that close to any kind of airport. Side note. I did jokingly yell to someone fishing off our nearby dock if they were seeing this too. They agreed, and could hear in their voice that they were unsettled by it also. I was part of a citizen's police academy for my city, and the dispatcher told me her best and worst stories. But I'm only going to share the worst. A man called and said his girlfriend had ended her life. Police responded and find her in the tub, having bled out. After interrogating the boyfriend, this is apparently the timeline. Girlfriend is pregnant and early 20 years old and didn't want to have kids, at least not then. This wasn't her first time. And she did the same thing she did last time. She got a hanger and tried to take care of it. Again, while he was playing video games. While well, she apparently messed up and bled out there in the tub, after he hadn't seen her for a while, he checked and found her in that state, and then went and called the cops. She essentially stabbed herself while he was distracted by video games and bled out. The thing I'll never forget though, is that one, it happened before once successfully, and two, that they disposed of the first body in a trash bag and were meant to do it the same time as the second. He was specifically playing video games with headphones on, which is why he didn't realize things had gone so badly until it was too late. I had a football coach back in high school who was also one of my teachers for a semester. He told us a story that freaked us out pretty bad. He had a coaching job at a small college in Montana when he was a lot younger and newly married. He said that after practice one evening, he was making his long commute home, and the route ran alongside just fields and rivers of hay, grain, and whatever. Since it was late summer slash early fall, it wasn't even approaching dark yet. His car was an old beat up pickup truck with just a bench seat. He's driving along when he sees a hitchhiker on the shoulder. This being back in the day, and in a small town in Montana, my teacher pulled over to let the guy in without a second thought. The man was described as wearing a really old, outdated style of suit. Not quite a zoot suit, but styled in a similar baggy way. He also had a big, stylish hat. This guy looked like he was straight out of the 40s and some sort of pimp. My teacher thought it was weird that he was so overdressed, it being so super hot, but maybe they were the only clothes he had. So the guy gets in next to my teacher without a word. My teacher asks him where he needs to go, and the guy just points forward, and my teacher drives on. Later, my teacher's tried talking to the guy, just trying to make simple conversation, but the guy wouldn't speak or even acknowledge him. He just pulled his hat down like he was sleeping. Out of nowhere, the guy just tips up his hat, looks out the window and says, stop the car. Now, 
my teacher pulls over and lets him out, not wanting to offend the possibly crazy man. The guy stands on the side of the road for a second, and then, at a dead sprint, just runs off into the field besides the road until my teacher couldn't see him anymore. Granted, the crop was fairly tall. He waits for a while, thinking maybe the guy had the runs or something and just didn't want to crap next to the road. After a long enough wait, my teacher gets back in the truck and starts to accelerate back on the road. The thing about really old trucks is they don't accelerate very fast. As my teacher got back on the road, he looks in his rear view mirror to check for a safe merge, but there wasn't a car in sight. What there was, was the hitchhiker, on all fours like an animal, running or crawling after the truck at an inhuman speed. Meanwhile, my teacher is beginning to fishtail as he attempts to go faster. The whole time his eyes are glued on the mirror watching the man chase after his car. Eventually, he was able to get up to speed and lost sight of the guy in his mirror. When he was able to stop at a gas station to use a payphone, he called his wife at home to tell her the story and to lock up the house. She thinks he's just messing with her and says that he has been talking with her co-worker about the hitchhiker. When he asks why she would think that, she reveals that apparently at her office in town where she worked, one of her co-workers told her a story of the exact same thing happening to them, and it's a well-known urban legend in that town. She thought it was just folks playing with the new girl at work who had to drive home alone at night. My teacher assured her he wasn't lying, and she evidently believes him and can vouch for his side of the story, because she showed up to one of the fundraisers and I asked her about it. So yeah, I just avoid lonely roads in Montana. And a huge thank you to Andrew, who let me share this story. This happened last year around Christmas time. I was on my way to visit my parents. I'm traveling from Nashville, Tennessee to Kent Island, and it's me and my dog, Kona. Mix of a pit bull, husky, and Labrador, and bulldog. I'm a tall, fairly well-built man, and it's about a 12-hour drive and it sucked. When we got to around Harrisonburg, I was tired and Kona needed to go potty. I also needed gas, so I pulled into a gas station around 10 p.m., pulled up to a pump and started getting gas. While the gas was going, I left Kona in the car and went inside to get some food and a much-needed Red Bull. When I walked out the gas station, I noticed a slender, raggedy man standing by my gas pump. As I reached my car, the man tells me that he's homeless and needs extra clothes, given that it's very cold outside. I'm empathetic. However, I tell him all I have in my truck a presents for my family and my little amount of clothing for myself. I apologize, tell him I can't help and wish him luck. He says that he noticed I had boxes in my truck and that anything would help. I tell him I have no clothes for him, but offered him the food I just bought at the gas station, but he refuses. He growls, agitated, and asks if he can have the heavy coat I'm wearing. Very nice pea coat that was a graduation gift from my mum. And I tell him no, and that I need it. He starts yelling and telling me that I'm spoiled, living off my parents, untrue, and I'm frightened, and Kona jumps into the driver's seat to observe. He reaches out to grab my shoulder and I back up and bump into my truck. He approaches it about one foot away from me and says, I said I need your help loudly with one hand on his pocket and the other on my shoulder. At this point, Kona goes mental, starts barking at the man and snarling her teeth. I can hear her bark and so can he. He looks at Kona and I tell him to leave me alone right now or else. I'll open the door and my dog will tear you apart. This seemed to do the trick. He backed away and I quickly opened the door and hopped in, forcing my dog out the driver's seat. She's still going nuts and I wait until he's far enough away to put away the gas pump. I start to drive away on the side of the gas station and see the same man jump into the passenger side of a dark SUV. I was going to get my dog a big steak, but five minutes later, she crapped in my truck, so I think she was scared. Anyway, let's not meet again. 
This event happened to me in 1998. I was driving along a one-way street that had three lanes. I was driving in the middle lane. I came to a traffic light that was red. I was three cars back in the line. To my left and closer to the lights, there's a sidewalk that's parallel to a driveway. And beside that driveway, a little shopping plaza. I looked towards the plaza, and there, on the back curve of the sidewalk, was a man. I looked curiously at him, because he was dressed in a black, business-like suit with a black tie, as well as a black, rimmed hat, like a cowboy hat, with an accompanying black briefcase. It was about midday and very hot and sunny. I asked myself why he was just sitting there in the hot sun dressed like that. I'm wondering if he was a street person or beggar, but why would he have that suit on? Suddenly he turned his head and looked straight into my eyes and kept a steady stare. This made me feel uncomfortable and uneasy, quite creeped out. I was far back in the traffic. Why would he be staring at me like that? I looked away and backed as he was still staring at me. The light changed to green, and as I was driving by, he kept his stare on me. I drove off quickly and went home still thinking how weird that was and how creepy he made me feel. I told my husband about this weird man, he said. Maybe he was waiting on someone. But why was he just standing there in the hot sun? Why not in the shade of the building, I thought. I went on with my day trying not to think about him. The next morning, my husband asked me to go to an electrical shop to buy an item. When he told me where to get it, I gasped. It was the same plaza where I saw the weird man. I told my husband that was the same plaza where I saw the man in the suit, and if I went there and saw him, I wouldn't go in. My husband said not to go if I didn't feel comfortable. But for some reason, I needed to go and satisfy myself that he was just a man and not some supernatural being or something to that effect, and that I was just being silly. I arrived at the plaza, parked near to the door of the shop. The store was barely opening, so very few cars were parked there. I was able to look around. There was no one around and I didn't see the man anywhere. So I breathed a sigh of relief and felt better to enter the shop. The shop entrance had four steps up to the door. I stopped at the top and had another look around, but there was still no one other than the traffic moving along. Inside was a long counter, sort of like a bank with four windows to purchase items. I was the only customer. Two windows were open beside each other with a sales representative at each. Behind the reps were two others working, moving around. Everyone looked at me, we all exchanged good mornings, and I went to the last window on the right. The door to the shop is now behind me and to my left. I was more relaxed now, as I ordered what I needed, and the representative sent another worker for the items, and she collected the payment for them. As I waited, I turned to look at the entrance door, and there, coming up the steps, was the man, wearing the same black suit, same hat, same briefcase in hand, and my heart nearly popped out my chest. I felt the blood rush to my face. Where did he come from? How did he get here so fast and why is he even coming in here? He opened the door slowly and walked in. He walked towards me, staring straight at me. His eyes were dark, and I'm not sure if he was smiling or had no expression at all. I was just so frightened. He walked slowly over to the counter next to me and turned to face the window beside me. He had his head slightly down. The lady sitting at the window did not look up from what she was doing. He said nothing to her, simply stood there. As a matter of fact, no one even looked at him from behind the counter. I was frozen for what felt like a moment. I turned back to my cashier and used my peripheral vision to watch him. He just stood there facing the second lady. I wanted to ask if anyone else saw him, but was too frightened and couldn't speak. It seemed like forever that I was standing there, but I was sure it was just a few seconds. The man then started to slowly turn his head towards me. 
I was just about to run out the shop, leaving my items behind when the cashier handed me a bag. I ran from the shop, looking behind me as I opened the door. He was slowly heading towards the door also. I ran down the steps, fumbled for my keys and got into my car as quickly as I could. I looked up at the shop doors as he exited. He was still staring at me with a grin, and I drove off as fast as I could. I looked behind me as I drove away and saw him still watching me as he walked down the steps. I do not know who, or what that was, or what he wanted, but I'm glad he didn't get into my car. I felt like that's what he wanted, to come with me. I avoided driving on that road for a very long time. I eventually drove past there with my husband at the wheel, but never saw the man in black. I have not been back to that shop or that plaza since, and it still gives me chills to this day. I've been searching for similar stories like this one on the men in black, but they're not the same. This was definitely creepy. Evil even. When I was 12, my mum and I went to the ER. She didn't feel well and asked me to fetch the paperwork from her car. I walk alone to our car in the parking lot and you hear these ladies outside the hospital yell, what are you doing? You better stay away from that little girl. I didn't have to put two and two together, reach the car and by the time I turn around, I see my mum walking up on this guy who's right behind me. My mum is a tough looking chick so when she asked him what the hell he was doing, he scrambled for an answer and said he was going to ask me for a ride. She yelled at him and says, Does she look like she's old enough to give you a ride? That guy disappeared there and then. I'm 22 now, and it still scares the life out of me to think, what would have happened if those random ladies weren't outside looking out for me? What would have happened indeed? I've had several experiences, all around similar locations, within months of each other. The first one happened when I had just adopted my puppy. He was 11 weeks old and loved everyone. He would run up to anyone and everyone, tail wagging. The friendliest thing. One day we were out on a walk in a large open cow field behind where I lived at the time. It was dusk and there wasn't really anyone else around, except this hiker in the distance walking towards us. My dog saw him and stopped in his tracks, got down low to the ground and just started growling. The hiker was still too far away for me to even make out his face, but my puppy was freaking out. As he got closer, I started to become seriously unnerved. He was pacing it towards us like a robot. That's the only way I can describe it or like the way military people walk. He was pale white and had these dead eyes that seemed to not see us at all. There was no acknowledgement of us whatsoever. He just robo sped walked straight in our direction. The dog was going crazy, growling, whining. I'd never heard him make those sounds before. When the hiker walked past me, I just felt this sense of dread hit me in the gut. It felt like evil. It was the single most terrifying encounter I've ever had. As he passed us, his eyes didn't move. It was as if he didn't even see us, even though the dog was growling at him. He just power walked past us and continued on. It was strange too, the direction he was going in, because all there was was a giant hill and it was getting dark. As soon as he made his way past us, me and the dog just broke into a run, as if we were both running for our lives. We ran all the way home. The next one happened in the same field. Again, I was walking the dog a couple of months after the first encounter. Again, just reiterating the point that he was the friendliest dog ever, especially as a pup. All he wanted to do was to run up to every stranger for pets. We're in this field, and there's a load of hikers with backpacks on, checking their maps. The puppy is checking them out, wagging their tails, when he zeroes in on one hiker lady who's standing still, just observing a tree. He dropped to the ground and started growling and whining, just like last time. She didn't acknowledge us and just stared at the tree with her dead eyes. And she was pale again, 
super pale. And when I caught a glimpse of her face properly, I felt that same sense of dread as the last time. She looked fairly normal, except she had almost no nose. I know this sounds insane. She had slits, like someone who'd done too much cocaine and had their nose fall off, even like Voldemort. I don't think the dog could have been growling at her appearance though, because her back was turned to us when the growling started. The third freaked me out the most. A friend and I were just leaving my house to walk the dog again when we realized we'd forgotten something inside. Where I live, there's no car access and it's considered the safest area ever. So the dog is usually free to roam around outside saying hello to people on the path. We left him outside for a second while we went in. And when I came out, there was a man in a business suit standing completely still staring at my dog. And my dog was staring back at him, not growling this time, just very still. It was so weird. He wasn't looking at the dog like he was afraid of it, more like he'd never seen one before. It was a curious look. Also, the fact he was wearing a suit was wild because I lived on a boat on the river. It's muddy and there are cows and dogs and stuff. It was just such a strange outfit to see someone in that location in. Almost as if someone was trying to play human and got that bit wrong. Anyway, so this stare off went on for a good minute while my friend and I kind of observed from the doorway when he walked on past the gate and into a field where the two other encounters occurred. We followed behind him because we happened to be going in the same direction. We followed him through the gate into the field and watched him veer off the path to our left towards the hill that the first hiker was marching towards. We continued on straight with the dog heading for the pub on the other side of the field when we realized I'd forgotten my purse. I turned around to go back but now the suit guy was back at the gate we'd all just come through. He was standing there staring at the gate, occasionally lifting the latch on it, as if he was inspecting it. It was super weird and creepy. What was he doing? He was just walking away and then turned around and came back to check that the gate mechanism was working properly. I decided not to return for my purse because I didn't want to have to walk past him again. The fourth experience happened in the same field a few months after, on a dog walk. My boyfriend was with me this time, but he told me to go ahead in the field while he finished getting ready and that he'd meet me there. So Papa and I walked out into the field and immediately spotted a hiker, Robo Power walking towards us as if he'd just come down from the hill. It wasn't the same guy as before, but it was the same kind of unsettling energy that I felt in my gut. It was wrongness, unease, and he was walking the exact same way. I pretended to chase my dog in the opposite direction and waited for him to pass through the gate before I got back onto the path. I watched him walk through it and disappear past the gate and down the path. Puppy and I carried on walking when about two minutes later, I felt like I needed to turn around so I did, and there he was again, power walking towards us with those dead eyes. I literally felt my blood run cold. I've never been so terrified. He was going so fast and with such intensity that the dog and I just started running. I fumbled for my phone and tried to call my boyfriend who didn't answer and veered off the path, cut through the long grass and circled back to the gate in a giant arc creepy alien dude continues power walking up the path he'd just come down, as if he's gonna go back up the hill. Sweating and out of breath, I spotted my boyfriend finally walking up to join us, and ran to him, babbling about the weirdo hiker with the bad energy. He goes, where? As I turn to point to him, we realize that he's now power walking backwards with his eyes locked on us, still heading back up the hill. Backwards. What? We were both seriously freaked out. These all happened in the summer. Come autumn, I was living alone on the boat with the dog while the boyfriend was away for work. One night around midnight, the dog and I were walking home from a pub quiz. It was always super dark on these country paths and my phone had died. 
so I had no light and was literally crashing into hedges and trees, trying to feel my way home by moonlight. And the moons and stars were super bright that night. Anyway, to get to my boat I have to cross over the river on a bridge. As I'm walking over the bridge, I was looking up at the stars as they were the only source of light. I ended up observing what I thought was a plane because it was moving steadily in my direction over that hill in that field where everything happened. As I'm watching it, it seemed to suddenly look at me. I don't know how to describe that. It's as if it suddenly realized it was being observed. I felt us connect and it shot off to the left super fast and blinked out of existence. Obviously in my mind, that's a UFO and it's hovering over the hill where the creepy aliens kept appearing from. So now I was terrified and I ran all the way home crashing into bushes like a crazy person because I couldn't see, locked the door and hid under the covers like a kid. A month or so after that, my pup woke me up at 4 a.m. because he needed to go toilet. Half asleep, I went to open the door for him and let him outside. I just want to paint a picture so you understand how strange this is. I live on a boat on the river. Where my boat was moored was the middle of the countryside. There are no lights on at night. Not much light pollution, no street lights. It's pitch dark apart from the light of the stars and moon. So when I stuck my head out of the boat to call the dog back and found myself being blinded by a white light, I was confused. I looked up at the sky and couldn't even open my eyes fully because it was so bright. It was light. This giant white mass really low in the sky, so low and bright I couldn't see anything else if I looked up. The dog came running back in and I slammed the door shut, locked it and went back to sleep. It was almost a you didn't see anything moment. I didn't even think anything at the time. Looking back, it makes no sense. I even went back to this part recently to make sure that no other lights I missed were there, like a new lamppost or something. There aren't. I don't know what these mean, but I moved back onto land and away from that hill and field, and they stopped happening. I actually walked up to the top of that hill one morning to check it out, and it's just a pretty picnic spot, not an alien HQ. But if anyone has any ideas, let me know. I'm a sheriff's deputy in a fairly busy county, so we see and hear strange things all the time, but this story gives me chills. There's an abandoned house in a rural area of the county that sits a good way back in the woods. Every so often our dispatch will receive a 911 call from the land at the residence with nothing but white noise. The dispatcher asks if anyone's there, but they never get an answer. Since it's an open 911 call and we know the address, we have to respond, and every time we do, there's no one there. The oddest thing is, there's no electricity or any signs of wiring going to the house. Every deputy that's been there gets a feeling of dread just by being on the property. I'm not sure of the history of the house. I don't know what could be there. Anyone have any thoughts on it? And on my way out of the property, I found a vehicle driving on the wrong side of the road. So I'm at the jail finishing paperwork on the DWI. But why don't we take this back to how it all started? To preface this, I consider myself to be pretty rational when it comes to odd situations, but I'm open to the idea of the supernatural. I wanted to share this with you because I thought some of you might care for it. Anyway. This was my first time walking up to this place, so it was definitely an experience. The trail is gated off, so I had to walk to it. It's about 200 yards back in the woods through very dense brush and trees. There was nearly zero light on the trail, and I had to really watch my step even with my flashlight. I jumped a deer on the way up, and it scared the living hell out of me. Once I turned the corner at the end of the trail and saw the house, my heart started racing, and I honestly felt like something was there with me. I started messing with my flashlight, phone, and notepad trying to get a good photo of the verification of the house when I just felt that sudden urge to leave. It wasn't a feeling of, I shouldn't be here, but more of, you need to get the hell out of here now. Having been in a very stressful situation in the past, I learned to trust this feeling. 
And I got the best photo I could and sped walked away down the trail towards my car. I'm almost embarrassed to say that I legitimately felt something was following me. I made my way back to the car, sat in it, and pointed my spotlight at the trailhead, waiting to see if something would come out of the woods. Fortunately, nothing did. I sat for a minute and caught my breath while I reviewed the photos, hoping it was sufficient, because I did not want to go back. I'm about to go off duty, so this is it for today. I'm really interested in what the hell happened to this place. And after a bit of researching, I did. I have some history on the property. It was built in 1890. The first deed on file was registered in 1901, and the property has been in possession of the same family that owns it today. From what I can find, the current owners of the property live out of state, but have previously lived either in the house or on the property some years back. The area it's in was a boom town during the late 1800s, but fizzled out shortly afterwards due to lack of profits from the mines. Other than that, I haven't found anything that makes the property stand out. On a more speculative note, the house sits a lot closer to an area where a Native American tribe was known to reside. I don't know what's happened there, but there's definitely some spooky activity. This took place sometime in late 2017, near Winter Park, Colorado, at a family friend's cabin. The cabin is in a fairly remote place with few houses around. I've been there twice before, but wasn't with my family during this trip, as I live in California now. My family had spent the day sledding and came back to the cabin in the early evening. My parents and their friends were playing board games downstairs while my three siblings and their two friends were upstairs playing. So at some point, my mum notices that my younger sister isn't playing with the rest of the kids and asks my other sister where she is. She said that she had got into her room to listen to music, so my mother thought nothing of it. An hour or so goes by, and my mum still hasn't heard or seen my sister, which was unusual, as she generally wouldn't pass up to play with friends. She again asks my other sister where she is, and she says she's still in her room listening to music. So my mum checks the room to find that she wasn't there. Immediately, my mum goes into a panic and starts screaming her name. No response. Everyone in the house starts searching all of the rooms in the house, but they can't find her anywhere. My mum then singles out my other sister and asks her why she had lied about my sister's whereabouts. She claimed she was being honest and that she had been listening to music. It's been about two hours since anyone has seen my sister. My mum goes outside to see if she can find her. And upon going outside, my mum tells me about the most horrifying thing she's ever seen. My sister is inside our car with her face plastered to the window, wide-eyed, screaming. My mum said it was like a horror movie. Everyone had assumed she had somehow locked herself in the car. I'm not sure how a very intelligent 10-year-old girl locks herself in a car she's been in thousands of times but I digress. Upon opening the door, my sister gets out, and my mum notices that she isn't behaving normally and appears to be in some kind of trance. They walk her inside and begin asking her questions about what had happened, but she doesn't respond to anything. She remains in this trance state for maybe an hour or two, so my mother gives up and puts her to bed. In the morning, my sister appeared to be acting somewhat normal, but seemed to be shaken up. My mother asks her how she ended up being in the car, but she says she doesn't remember how she got there. She says she only remembered one thing. As she was locked in the car, she saw a man dressed in all black approached her. She said she was terrified and tried to exit the vehicle. Then the man in black came closer and told her that he would let her out, but she had to do something for him. He holds up what appeared to be a black rose to the window and tells her he wants her to come out so then he can give it to her. 
After this, my sister remembers nothing. After hearing this story, my mum goes outside to check the area around the car. To her astonishment, she sees a trail of footsteps going from the car out past the house into the surrounding forest. No one had been playing or walking around that area before then, according to my mum, so she seemed quite disturbed by the tracks. We still don't know what to think about this, but my mother said that the look on my sister's face in the car was sincerely terrifying. Not sure what actually happened that night, but the similarities of seeing a black figure and being in a trance-like state made me see a connection. If I'm not wrong, I believe Colorado is also a hotspot for missing 411 cases. Thankfully, my sister didn't become one of them, but maybe she saw something similar to what others have seen before their disappearance. I live in the downtown area of a pretty major city. My street is relatively quiet, but I can't say so much for the surrounding neighborhoods. My city as a whole is infamous for drug activity and armed violence. We also have an increasing number of homeless people as our shelters have almost all closed down. I've generally never minded. Stuff happens and I didn't grow up in the best of circumstances either. I would never stereotype anyone based on their housing status. And I was even involved with a homeless outreach program at the time. I left and never went back after this and I've been hesitant to help anyone since. It's 10 or so at night, and I'm heading to my partner's parents' house, about 30 minutes away from my own. I get about two blocks away before remembering I need gas. I'm not too fond of the idea of stopping at a gas station near my apartment at the time, because it was quite late, but I wasn't gonna make it all the way out into the suburbs without it. So I pull into the one of the not so great parts of the neighborhood, but it was brightly lit and there were a lot of people walking by, so I try not to think too much of it. I get my gas and go to grab a few snacks. When I come back out, a tall man in a dark coat and a brown beanie started casually chatting to me. I couldn't tell if he was 25 or 40. His voice was so low I could barely make out what he was saying. Something about being a music producer and working on a new project. He seemed friendly enough, or maybe a little erratic. So I let him ramble for a few minutes before politely telling him I needed to get going. He tells me his name is Mac. I unlock my door and get in, and this guy gets in the passenger seat with me. At this point, he is no longer a friendly, chatty stranger. I'm terrified. His demeanor hasn't changed though, and he's acting like it's the most normal thing in the world. While I've had more than my fair share of encounters with creeps, Nothing like this has ever happened to me. I don't scream, I don't tell him to piss off. I sit there in fear of what he's gonna do if I resist it. I need money for my son, he says. He's in the hospital with a gunshot wound. His mom's waiting for me. I know this story is a complete and utter farce, but I just want him out my car. I give him what little I have in my wallet and tell him I need him to get going. Can you drive me to my friend's house? It's right up the road. What? Isn't he supposed to be going to the hospital for his son? I try to decline as politely as possible and tell him my boyfriend is waiting for me. And this opens the floodgates to a bunch of personal questions about my life. What my boyfriend and I are going to do when I get there and extremely gross unsolicited comments about my body. I've tried to block out his exact words, but it was incredibly vile. And at this point, I'm sure that this is the end. I'm trapped in my own car. The gas station parking lot is empty and I can't call the police. And even if I could, would it be a bad idea? I wish I could tell you I had some genius idea that helped me to get out of this, but I didn't. I'm panicked and frozen and finally agree to take him to where he supposedly wanted to go. He has me drive around this neighborhood winding through dark side streets with a lot of seemingly abandoned houses for what seems like forever. He finally had me stop in a parking lot of a beauty salon where his friend supposedly works and is gonna get a ride with her to the hospital. The parking lot is on a very busy street and brightly lit. If he were gonna end me, he picked a terrible place to do it. 
He was all over the place and speaking rapidly. Little details of his story kept changing consistently, as he's clearly high as a kite and probably mentally unstable too. All the while he continues to act like we were lifelong friends and nothing about this entire situation was remotely terrifying. He keeps telling me he would give anything to trade places with my boyfriend. Ugh, gross. And I gently keep reminding him I need to be leaving. And he keeps telling me to stay because this friend will give me money and pay me back for helping his son out. I wonder why she couldn't just give given him the money directly if that were the case. I ask him what's taken his friend so long. And he says he doesn't know and asks if he can use my phone to call. I say no. Maybe this was all an elaborate ploy to steal my phone and take off. I'm still thinking he could end me though. So I reluctantly hand the phone over, although I should have dialed the number for him. And he's taking a long time to dial while I'm looking away. And then all of a sudden, he's looking up. And then before I know it, he's looking up the adult section of the internet and has taken out his member there and then. I wish I had a way to prove this, and I know it sounds ridiculous, but it's true. At this point, the image is burned into my mind. Should have seen that one coming, I guess. I lose my cool and tell him to get out and that I'm done. What do you think he does? He starts crying, wailing about how hot I am and he hates to think about me with another man and how I turned him on so much. I'm staring at him in disbelief like, okay, but you need to get out now. He straightens up with a big smile on his face and goes, I'm just messing with you. I wouldn't cry like that. Are you sure you don't want to take me to a completely different location? Yes, I'm sure. I told him my boyfriend was probably worried about me as I'd had to have been there an hour ago at this point. And somehow that got his attention and he left. I drove to my partner's house shaking. He and I had just started dating at this point and I didn't want him to think I was stupid or something. So I nonchalantly told him I was dealing with a creep at the gas station and it took me a little while. Much later, I told him the real story and he was appropriately horrified. I wish I could say it stopped there, but I started getting calls from all kinds of local numbers for the next few weeks. Only one voicemail was left and it was just a lot of breathing and very faint words I couldn't make out. I'm creeped out by this, but tried to dismiss it as paranoia. One time, I actually answered. Hey, it's Mac. I, I have your money. I felt like I needed to throw up. I don't need it. Leave me alone. I hang up as he starts rambling about how beautiful I am and all this other stuff. How he can't wait to see me again. I block every strange number that's been calling me and the calls stop. I can't imagine how he got it. My only thoughts was that when he opened my phone to call his friend, he looked at my contacts where my own number was displayed at the top. You may never wonder why I never called the cops. My city is extremely well known for its police using excessive force, especially in the downtown area. People regularly lose their lives by the police here and I've personally witnessed someone being beaten up by the cops for quite minor infractions. I'm not intending to make this any kind of political statement or expressing my opinions here, but I genuinely felt like I would have been putting myself in further danger by calling the cops even after this were over. Best case scenario, nothing would have been done and I would have been chewed out by the cops for being stupid enough to let this man in my car. Worst case, something terrible happens to the guy and I have to live with that for the rest of my life. I've regretted that since though, because a friend of mine later had an encounter with him as well on a complete opposite side of the city and gave her the same story about his son in hospital. She ended up driving him around aimlessly for an hour before screaming at him to get the hell out. So Mac, you're welcome, but let's never meet again. My mother and I like going for walks together even if the weather isn't entirely the best. One autumn evening about four or five years ago, I would have been about 21 or two, we decided to go for a walk on the local path in the Minnesota woods near our home. It was cloudy, a bit late in the evening, a little windy and just spitting rain, but we went anyway. As we walked, we walked at decent speed since it was quite chilly, 
when we noticed no one else was on the path, which we guessed was just due to the weather, and that was fine. The sun was also going down, and Minnesota is full of black bears. We came up on a side path with a pretty bridge to the side, and I wanted to go take some photos of us together on it, but my mother said she had a bad feeling deep in the pit of her stomach. There could be bears that way. We ought to stay on the main path, she said. I convinced her anyway, and we went to take a few pictures together, then got back onto the main path. We laughed about her bad feeling and brushed it aside. When we got back on the main path, we noticed a man dressed in all black, quite a way up the main path from us. His back was to us, so he was walking in the same direction we were, down the path. We hadn't seen him behind us at all prior to this, and he was walking fairly slowly. After a while, I noticed a break in the trees off the main path, one less marked and not meant for locals to go on. I knew if we were followed, we would be on a high hill overlooking the river that ran by the path. Again, I wanted to go, and again my mother's good mood was soured by a bad feeling. We went despite the terrible feeling she had. I had one at this point as well, but only a small nagging in the pit of my stomach. I suppose nerves, maybe brought on by my mother being so nervous herself. We walked up a ways until the trees cleared out, and it was a beautiful view. At this point, the nagging in my stomach got much worse, and I too immediately thought, there's a bear here, we're being watched. I scanned the woods around us, and a small movement caught my eye. A man in a blue jacket was standing just behind the tree line staring at us. Look, there's someone there. The man immediately took off like a flash of lightning, running in the direction that would take him deeper into the woods, not back to the path. My mum turned to see him as I pointed, following the movement with my finger. She didn't see him, but we both agreed at once that it was time to go back. We hurried back down towards the main path, but when we made it to the very edge of the trees and the main path, it was blocked by the man dressed in black who had been ahead of us before. He just stepped off the main path and was about to head to the same clearing where we'd been standing. When he saw us coming, he turned around on a dime, so fast I didn't see his face, and started walking hurriedly back in the same direction we'd seen before. We ran out of the path and got to the car, drove to the other end of the path where the man in black would be exiting, and saw him coming, but when he saw the car he turned again and started walking in the other direction. We went back to the other side and waited, but he never showed up. To this day, I think those two men were conspiring, and that if we'd have stayed even a moment longer, we may have ended up in that river dead. I thank my gut feeling and always listen to it when it begins to gnaw inside me. Warning. And I suggest everyone else does too. Now that we've heard some of the true horrors that dispatchers have to go through, I have a little bonus for something for you to hear so that you can really appreciate what it's like. I'm feeling tired and a little more burnt out than usual today kid had me up late, so this is probably a little more negative than I usually am. That said, the way I'm feeling right now accurately sums up how you'll feel a lot as a dispatcher. Can you type, talk, and hold three to four conversations at the same time? You'll learn to. The hours suck. The pay is usually around minimum cost of living for your area, but there's plenty of OT everywhere. You'll work with people who are in various stages of idealistic and enthusiastic, slowly transitioning to burnt out and bitter, and a crap ton of people with the same last names as command staff, and officers who make you wonder, how do you not get fired on a near hourly basis? Stay long enough, and you'll eventually call these people boss. Now for the big con. You'll hear the same messed up stuff if you do this long enough. A mother watching her son OD sounds drastically different than a woman screaming for any other reason. You'll talk to domestic abuse victims, 
Sometimes they're getting beat. Sometimes you'll know them. Sometimes you may hear people die in a car wreck or burn in a fire. Sometimes people will end their lives while they're on the phone with you. Sometimes you'll hear the fresh reaction of the parents of an infant that stopped breathing in the night. And the most frustrating part is as soon as you disconnect, you get a call from someone upset about a dog barking or a neighborhood's grass being too high or a guy not bothering anyone but looking suspicious. And you'll have to treat each caller exactly as professionally as the last. And after all that, you'll take all the attitude of young cops who think you're a secretary and clueless member of the public who really have no idea how hard your job is and yet assume you're somehow lesser for doing it. That's the male side. If you're a female, you'll be assumed to be someone chasing badges and you'll have the added difficulty of calling people in and treating you disrespectfully because they assume you're a secretary in a bimbo and not an experienced professional or just a cop. None of which is true, by the way. We have female officers working light duty here or just not a cop. None of which is true, by the way, as we have female officers working light duty here and as well as career dispatchers who just happen to have breasts and sometimes they're 10 times the dispatchers of their male counterparts. But there are some pros because if that's the way I feel about it, then why stay? Well, in spite of it all, you do it to help people when they really need it. That's a good feeling. You are sometimes the vital link that leads to taking a bad person off the streets or getting help for a vulnerable person before someone victimizes them or they hurt themselves. Occasionally you'll meet an older officer who says, I can't do your job. And you know what? That means a lot. There's also the fact that if you do do it, it's a permanent job and there's security for as long as you want it. It's transferable. And with my experience at this point, I'm confident I could move anywhere in the country and find a job that will pay the bills. If only just whenever I want. Typically emergency response and public safety is resistant to change. That can be a con, but it also means pensions are commonplace and benefits tend to be pretty good. You've also got to consider that you might hear an officer dying while on your radio. Every other call I mentioned pales in comparison. You'll never forget it. I and you'll always wonder what you could have done differently, if anything, to change the outcome. Ask yourself if you're the type to be able to handle it and still return home with your family and be present with them. This really isn't for everyone. But if you decide to become a dispatcher, best of luck to you. Don't be afraid to ask questions and remember to ask to be treated fairly and with respect. I was introduced to UFO hunting by one of my grandmothers who got my mum and I into it. She introduced us to Art Bell and Coast to Coast who my mum hated, but I adored and picked up on my shortwave anytime I could. I still pick it up and midnight in the desert when I can. One of my more memorable experiences was chasing a UFO. The night started off normal. Young teenage me didn't want to get a shower. Mum wanted me to get a shower and a lot of PA arguing from the other room. You know, so I finally get in the shower and my mum yells at me. I'm thinking she's telling me to get in the shower and I yell back that I'm already in it, really rather annoyed when she basically stands outside our bathroom and tells me to get dressed if I wanted to see a UFO. I bolted out of there, got dressed, and my mom's on the house phone with grandma, mid nineties, so we had one cell phone, but it wasn't used that often and tended to have limited minutes. My mom, siblings and I pack into our car and follow this strange bright white light through the desert and up to our grandma's house. We pile out, grandma watching outside and we all stand in the yard watching this one light move towards the eastern sky. As we're watching, a few more lights appeared above the eastern horizon. They all seemed to dance in pace up and down, movement no aircraft can produce. 
A few minutes pass and my siblings and I hear what sounds like an electric guitar scale come from my grandparents' cable box. Not the TV itself, but above it. And they had no other speaker. So we go inside and check it out. Nothing interesting. Mum and Grandma follow us inside and wonder why we dashed. Then we told them about the scale. Discovered, my sibling and I had heard it on and off key. Walked outside and the lights were all gone. Every single one of them. I know my earlier description sounds like it's nothing unusual, but it was. I live with a small, used-to-be commercial airport in the same area that the lights were in. I know the approach path of planes from observing them, and I could tell you that what I saw was no plane. And we still glimpse odd UFOs every once in a while. Nothing big, just nothing I can really identify. That was my most exciting experience, though. I was canvassing for work today and had a really strange encounter. I don't really believe in aliens on Earth or monsters, entities or the like. But this afternoon I was going door to door with a co-worker when we happened upon a very strange man. He was fairly tall, of average build, light complexion with dark hair that stuck out at odd angles. But his eyes and mouth were just wrong somehow. The eyes were very large and unsettling in their intensity making it very hard to keep eye contact, a problem that I don't typically have. The mouth had a sort of V shape with the middle on the top lip protruding too much downwards and the sides of the top lip arching up as well, making the mouth seem off somehow. He was polite enough and seemed somewhat surprised, which is normal for door to door canvassing as no one is really expecting you or anything. He just kind of brushed us off quickly and we went on our way. My coworker was also thrown off by the guy and remarked that it was weird. When we were driving away later, I said, he almost seems like he wasn't a person, but an alien wearing a human suit that didn't have time to put it on properly. There was a feeling of wrongness about the whole thing that's hard to describe. I mean, I see all kinds of people on a daily basis, including odd and unusual folk but they don't make me feel like I've stumbled into something strange the way that this guy did. In early 2007, I was freshly 18 and newly married, living in Fort Polk, Louisiana, while my husband was training at Fort Benning. I was born and raised in Alaska, so living in the continental US was a vastly new experience for me. My husband had a weekend off, though he was not allowed to leave the base. So we bought a Greyhound bus ticket for me to visit him and meet the soldiers he became friends with. I had never been on a Greyhound bus before, but I was excited to drive through the South and see new places and have my own little adventure. Sure, plenty of creeps bothered me on the bus and at the stations, but I still had interesting conversations, met new people, and generally enjoyed the experience. Regardless of the time, each station we stopped at was open and offered food, outlets for charging, and bathrooms. So when we arrived in Columbus, Georgia at about 2am, I expected the station to be open. It wasn't. Everyone else who ended their journey there had a ride waiting for them. And suddenly, I was alone outside a locked building in the middle of downtown Columbus, full dark and terrified. I didn't really know what to do, and my phone was nearly dead from the long last leg of travel. I thought about walking to a gas station, but I had no idea which direction to go in, and I couldn't see any nearby lit buildings. I truly expected the station to be open, thinking I would stay there for a bit while my phone charged and I had something to eat, and could have access to a phone book so I could call a cab. All I had was an old sign hanging on the side of the building with incomplete phone numbers for taxi companies. The numbers had faded, been scrapped off and defaced. There was only one complete phone number and it was handwritten in Sharpie at the top of the list. 
Better than nothing, right? Wrong. I called the number, and a guy answered, casual and sleepy, asking who I was. I apologized, explaining I was trying to call a cab. When the guy perked up immediately and said, Oh yeah, that's me. I'm on my way. My phone died 10 minutes after I made the call, and it was another 15 minutes before the guy showed up in a traditional looking yellow taxi. I noticed the cab wasn't marked. No logo, number rates, anything. But it had that taxi light thing on the top, and in my young, naive mind, seemed totally legit. He waved me over. I got in and asked him to take me to Fort Ben. Finally, feeling some relief. The doors auto-locked, and I will never forget the first thing he said to me. He was silent until we got onto a main road and said, Did you really think it was a good idea to call a number written in Sharpie? I froze. In retrospect, no. It wasn't the best idea I'd ever had. But I had so few options, and I didn't want to be stranded in a huge foreign city in the middle of the night. I don't know what else I could have done. After a minute, I tried to laugh it off, and hoped he didn't notice I was shaking. I reached for my phone, remembering it was dead, and realised that if something happened to me, no one would know that I even made it to Georgia. Staring at me in the rearview mirror, the driver told me what was going to happen. There's no use getting to Benning this early. The post hotel isn't even open. Drive around with me for a while, hang out, and I won't even charge you. I told him no thanks, that I really needed to get to Fort Benning right away. Nah, he said, and that was it. We drove to a worn down apartment complex, where he told me he was picking up a regular to keep me company. I didn't reply. What could I even say? I wasn't raised religious, but I was praying to God for some kind of miracle. Out came a woman, who looked a bit like a cliché prostitute. Tube top, mini skirt, smudged mascara, and an unlit cigarette hanging from her lips. Short but ratty bleached hair, pocked marked face, cheap purse, and I have no idea who or what she truly was. But she got in the front passenger seat and lit her cigarette. She turned to me and said, Don't worry, he's cool. We're cool. Ah, uh, okay. That definitely helped. I had never considered jumping from a moving vehicle before. But even if I wanted to, the back doors were child safety locked, and I couldn't open them. Trust me, I was trapped like a cage animal, just waiting to die. I felt so stupid, so foolish, sitting in the back seat of a cab with no idea what to do, and no idea what was going to happen to me. I kept trying to rationalise it, downplaying the situation in my mind. I was too afraid and frozen to actually do anything anyway. As we were driving around, the girl was telling me about the driver, how he was ex-military and had just started this cab business. What a down-to-earth fun guy he was and how lucky I was to be picked up by him. How I was cute and young and everything was cool, cool, cool. Her words were a bit slurred and I knew she was either drunk or high on something. I didn't really want to know. We pulled up outside a small blue house sometime later, an hour before the break of dawn, and the driver told the girl to keep an eye on me while he went inside. I'm in full-blown panic mode, the suspense of it all making it so much worse. The girl offered me a cigarette to calm my nerves. I wasn't a smoker, but I said yes. She got out of the cab and opened my door, stumbling a bit before sitting on the curb and lighting another cigarette. 
She lit mine, and I sat next to her. And I started thinking about whether or not I could outrun her with my heavy backpack, and how long the driver would be inside for. Without me asking, the girl told me the driver was inside, showering in preparation. I asked what he would be showering and preparing for, but she kept repeating how he was cool, and how much fun we were going to have, and how cute I was. Then she said, Ranger Cab, because he was like a ranger or something. Or maybe that was his dad. He's a good looking guy, military muscles. God finally answered my prayers, when the girl slumped over and passed out on the grass. I saw the track marks on her arm, and guessed heroin. And apparently, the driver was inside taking a shower, and wasn't about to come back in the next few moments. I grabbed my backpack, and ran like hell. I don't exactly remember what happened after I started running. I know I took off as fast as my feet would carry me, and that I didn't dare stop to catch my breath. One minute I was sprinting for my life, lungs on fire, and then I was trudging along with tears in my eyes as I walked through the Fort Benning Gate with my military spouse ID, asking how to get to the base hotel. Honestly, I wish I knew how I got there. I was in deep survival mode, and didn't stop to process any of it until I made it to my room. I don't know if someone gave me a ride, if I followed a map, or what. I never blocked a memory out like that before, or ever again. I told my husband everything when I finally saw him. He didn't believe me. I probably wouldn't have believed me either. His lack of trust made me think no one could take me seriously so I never went to the police. I still had the number I dialed saved on my call history. I knew the girl called it the Ranger Cab. What I didn't have was the confidence or support to report it. Sometimes I think back to that day and wonder what would have happened if the girl did not let me out of the cab and if she hadn't have passed out on the ground and if the driver had never stopped for a shower. It's one mystery that I do not need the answers to. I grew up in a small town in Texas. We lived in such a small town that everyone knew each other. And even if you didn't know someone's name, that at least their face was recognizable or familiar. Also, I grew up with three other siblings and we would all walk to and from school together. At the time of this memory, I was a young seven-year-old boy, and I remember it clearly being an intensely hot day. For reasons I can't recall, I was walking home alone that day, which was highly unusual and rarely ever happened. We didn't live too far from the school, but we could take certain tucked away routes that we perceived as shortcuts. This particular route was occupied by just a few houses and most of them were empty. So it was usually a very quiet, inactive area with little chances you would even encounter cars driving by. I remember thinking it was so hot that day and my backpack was so heavy and I couldn't wait to get home. Halfway to my house, quietly out of nowhere, I hear a car slowly driving behind me. After walking for a while, I finally turned around to see it was a small black car, and I could barely see that there was more than one person in it. Being a very shy and anxious kid, I tried to ignore it and keep walking but it continued to slowly trail behind me. Part of me thought that this was all a prank. When my family first moved to this small town, we would get teased a lot for being the only Asian family in town. After what seemed like the longest and most awkward minutes of slowly being followed, I started to feel uncomfortable. So I stopped walking 
and stepped further aside to see if they would just eventually pass me. Even at the time of this happening, I never thought I was in danger, because this small quiet town was known for being very safe, and like I said, everyone knew each other. The car then slowly drove up to me, and rolled down the passenger window. There were three young men in the car. They weren't teenagers, and looked to be in their twenties. I remember being caught off guard by not recognising any of them, which was very strange for this town. The guy in the passenger seat then said with a smile, Hey, do you need a ride? Still being ignorant and not sensing any danger, I thought it was so tempting, because it was so hot outside. Regardless of actually wanting to get in the car, I just said, what? He began to repeat. Do you want a ride? Then the guy in the back seat of the car began to open the back door and let me in as he grinned at me. Once again, even though I actually wanted a ride home, I just said, What? All three of them smiled and chuckled. The man again said, Do you want a ride? With a smile. At this point, I was so embarrassed and anxious, once again I just said, What? The silence in the background was interrupted by the sound of a screen door opening in the distance. I could see a familiar elderly woman just looking at us from her door. Looking back, I think she did this to let them know of her presence and possibly scare them away, because this was obviously a very sketchy scene that she was witnessing. I turned back to look at the men. None of them were smiling anymore. They all looked serious. The guy in the passenger seat said so seriously and abruptly, get in the car. It almost felt like a scowl. I felt like I was being put on the spot and could feel the strange sense of urgency. So naturally, I became even more nervous and once again just said, What? I then hear the woman's screen door shut, and the elderly woman was now standing on her porch, making her presence even more evident. The men were all clearly very annoyed, and the man in the passenger seat just said, Forget it, as the guy in the back seat shut the door, and they quickly drove off still being completely oblivious to the danger of the situation. I remember thinking as they drove off, dang it, I could have gotten a ride home. Which is both funny and scary to think of today. I then turned to the elderly lady on her porch, and she gave me a gentle smile, and I shyly smiled back and continued to walk home. It was years later that I realized how shady of a situation this was, and I'm so grateful to the old woman who practically scared those strange men away. I was so close to willingly getting in their car, and if she wasn't there, who knows what these men could have done when they lost their patience. It gives me chills today to think of what may have happened if I got in the car with those strangers. So thank you, kind elderly woman. And to the three strangers in that black car, let's not meet again.